Hey, welcome to my coffee booth at Felton High's Flea Market. Just a second, I need to add the finishing touches to this latte. Perfect. Guys, try this. It's the special drink that I came up with for our two-month anniversary, which, FYI, is today. How romantic. What's the name of this drink? I think Patrick should name it. We can call that Paige's Vom. You know, because it reminds me of when we were five and you threw up in the back of my mom's car during our road trip. <laughs> Stop! I'm not kidding! Me neither! It's one of my favorite memories, as that's when I fell deeply in love with you. Or how about, why is everything a joke to you? Just leave! We're done! I'm sorry about that. Ugh, let's start over. I'm Paige, and everyone calls me Perfect Paige, because, well, everything about me is perfect. That must be thanks to my parents. My dad's a hospital director, and my mom's a university president. They both excel in their jobs, juggle family affairs, never quarrel, and always have smiles on their faces. And me, I'm beautiful, smart, and have some talents, such as making drinks. My dream is to run my own coffee shop. On the side of the dream job at the national TV station that I will definitely get, then I'll come home to my dream boyfriend who's a flawless man that I can count on. And we'll have a perfect love story like my parents. Then why did I choose that funny guy as my boyfriend, you ask? Ugh. Before he became my now ex, Patrick was a close friend since childhood. We lived in the same neighborhood, and... It was my friend Doris's birthday, but she came up with a stupid condition that all the girls had to bring along a boy. Ugh, please. This sounded ridiculous, so I presumed it was a joke and showed up alone. Only everyone else had a plus one with them. Paige, you need to stop being so picky and give a guy a chance. How about your bestie Patrick? He's nice, smart, great at basketball, and he's pretty cute, right? No, 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 we go way back. He's all right, I guess, but that's not enough. I, there's no one on this planet who can reach your ridiculously high standards. He's the best you're gonna get, and look, he's also so funny. Patrick's sense of humor is by far his most infuriating trait. Fine, perfect page. You'll just have to show up to the prom alone then. And I doubt that's a perfect thing to do. I guess Doris's words played on my mind, because when Patrick walked me home, I blurted out, Hey, if we're both single after we turn 17, then let's date. Then my perfect school year will end with a perfect prom night with my high school sweetheart, just like in a rom-com. Huh? Have you eaten too much frosting or something? No, of course not. I just can't possibly turn up to prom dateless. Oh, the outrage. As if anyone could ever dare to go to prom without a date. But I'm not just anyone. Such a humiliating thing would be a scratch on the diamond, which is me. Okay, okay. I'll do whatever you want. Time passed by and I concentrated on my studies and my hobby. Then before I knew it, I turned 17 and still didn't have a boyfriend. I heard this strange noise coming from my balcony. Patrick? What is he doing with a rose in his mouth? Hey there, do you remember our oath once upon a time? Okay, fine. From today, I allow you to be my boyfriend. Go home and get ready. Tonight will be our first date. Wait, you serious? It's not a joke. Why are you always joking? All right, all right. Where does my love want to go on our first date? So we started dating and so far so good. Seeing as he'd known me for years, he knew what I liked and what I was thinking. He never argued with me and just did what I asked. And best of all, everyone complimented us and said we were a match made in heaven. There was just one problem. Patrick's sense of humor was ruining the romantic vibe. So that brings us to the present and why I ended our relationship. Later that night, Patrick called and apologized, but I confirmed that the breakup was still on as I didn't want to cause strain to our friendship. He seemed pretty surprised by this, but Patrick being Patrick, he soon made light of it. Back to the friend zone. Alrighty. So no need to pick up Paige every morning anymore. Nice. See you in math class. For some reason, I was a little sad that he'd agreed to do this so quickly, but it had just been a dumb fling anyway, right? But hang on, what about prom? I couldn't lose face with my friends, so I joined a dating app to continue the search for my Prince Charming. Ugh, too short, too nerdy, too glary. And after days of desperately swiping, I finally found a guy that caught my eye. I mean, I couldn't really see his face, but he had to be hot. I messaged him right away, and you know what? We got on so well and soon arranged a date. I fixed my hair one more time and walked over to him. Hello, you. <gasps> Patrick? Surprise, my bae. I'm your perfect mystery partner. Patrick, I swear to God. How do you feel? Angry much, huh? Then now you know how my poor heart felt when you broke it to pieces. <laughs> I was fuming, but Patrick kept up his annoying grin. 
So you're that starving for love? All right, I know your ideal type way too well. Let me find you a guy. You know, attractive boys tend to hang out in a herd. We'll see. You know, being handsome is only one thing on my list. The first candidate was this guy called Beavis, the basketball team captain. We started talking, and it went well enough for him to invite me to go watch his game. He even winked at me before he scored a perfect three-pointer. All the jealous glances turned to me. Looks like Patrick really found me a good deal. At first, this was kind of cool, but soon all of the love letters and gifts Beavis received got kind of grating. Worst of all, he accepted them all. He didn't seem to be faithful at all. Also, his grades really sucked, and he was always so sweaty. This first candidate is out. Next was Daniel, a cute genius who liked to invent things. I really love how passionate he looks when he's working on something. He's so talented. But he always showed up late to our date with the excuse there was some machine malfunction. His clothes were always stained with grease, and all he talked about was research. Oh, actually, I have zero idea what you're on about. You're so robotic. I went home and already saw Patrick making himself at home in our living room. He must have heard the news. So, sporty boy has too many fangirls. No good. Mechanic boy is too busy. No good. Then maybe a rich boy with a lot of free time could treat you like a princess. Patrick introduced me to this guy called Eric, the school rich kid who showered me with lavish gifts. That was nice, but then his clinginess felt suffocating. He always seemed to be there, and he wouldn't quit calling and texting me. He also spent longer than I did getting ready. No thanks. Why? You're too clingy. If you have too much time on your hands, then why don't you go do something useful? What? I only cling on to you because I care. But I guess I was just wasting my time on useless things because you're just a stubborn, spoiled girl that finds fault in everything and doesn't appreciate other people's feelings. No one's ever spoken to me like that before. Useless? Stubborn? Spoiled? Eric's words were still echoing in my head as I walked home. Then I saw Patrick approaching. What's up? Who got you mad this time? Is it Eric? His downside is being too rich, isn't he? Not Eric, it's you. You deliberately set me up with those weirdos, didn't you? What are you saying? I only chose the guys that suit you best. No, they don't. I don't think you really understand me at all. Oh, really? How well do you understand me then? If you're that confident, then go find me an ideal girlfriend. Fine, maybe you'll quit bugging me if you're taken. Hmm, turns out trying to find a girlfriend for Patrick was trickier than I thought. He's so friendly with everyone, I actually have no idea what his type is. Whatever, he made no effort to find me a nice guy anyway, so I'll just return the favor. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, Nina, I know her, a scandalous hot girl who always goes overboard on the wax statue makeup. I'm pretty sure she likes Patrick as she's always cheering him from the sidelines during his games. Patrick, let's see what fun date you can have with this girl. The next day, I walked straight up to Nina and asked her if she wanted to go on a date with Patrick. She looked kind of surprised, but then after thinking it over, she agreed. They met at a cafe, and after I introduced them to each other, I sat at a nearby table and observed. I expected things between them to be super awkward, but surprisingly, they seemed to get along quite well. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but they kept bursting out laughing. They acted like they'd known each other for ages. Patrick and Nina bid farewell, and as soon as Nina walked away, I jumped out and asked, How can you have fun chatting with Nina all night? Don't you see her laughing out loud? That's not very ladylike. So she's fun. Everyone has flaws, though I don't even think it's a flaw. It's cute. Fine, let's see how long you two can have fun. But in the following days, I still saw Patrick with Nina. Then at school, I overheard Nina talking to her friends. Tonight? No wonder you've been looking so happy all day. Of course, it's going to be a big confession. Huh? They've only been dating for five minutes. I wonder why Patrick liked Nina that much. So I decided to stalk them. I followed them to this posh restaurant. Ugh, so humiliating. Who would have thought that Perfect Page would do something like this? But there's no way back now. They spoke for a bit, then Patrick went to answer a phone call. I thought he was going to plan his confession or something. But then, to my surprise, a man swooped in and sat down with his arm around Nina. That's Beavis! What? How could they be so shameless? I quickly ran to find Patrick, who was chilling in a corner, so I quickly pulled him back to the table. Look, you're being cheated on! Cheated on? What do you mean? The girl who's been clinging on to you for days has been flirting with your teammate. Stop playing dumb, please. Nina is just my friend. She likes Beavis, not me. Nina clearly likes you. She follows you to every game. How could she switch to Beavis out of nowhere? You should defend me, not a stranger like her. Did you forget Patrick and I are teammates? Nina was actually there for me. 
I agreed to meet Patrick just because I wanted to ask him to talk to Beavis for me. Sorry for misleading you. <laughs> What's with a bulldog's frown? We just successfully match made a couple. Let's go give the lovebird some private space. I guess you'll have to find me another girl. Don't act like we're close. I don't want a flippant and heartless friend like you. You're the heartless one. You're making a mess with your ridiculous standards and expect others to follow all of that. Then act like a victim? Don't you see how Patrick is the real casualty here? He tended to your absurd needs, even helped you get a boyfriend, yet all you do is treat him like garbage. Selfish Paige, you're not as perfect as you think. What? What do you know? You're just a plastic girl after all. Yeah, I might be plastic, but at least I realize what my flaws are to try to fix them. Unlike you, you call yourself a diamond when actually you're just a silly pebble. Was this really what people thought of me? I couldn't believe anyone would ever describe me with such ugly words. <laughs> I ran home and shut myself away in my room. It made me so distraught knowing that other people thought I was bad like that. Mom came into my room to check on me and I ended up blurting everything to her. How everyone seemed to hate me now. How I might be alone for the rest of my life without finding my perfect other half and having a happy ending like mom and dad. Sweetie, everyone has flaws. I do and so does your father. I can have quite the temper, but your dad always knows what to say and do to calm me down. While he is terrible at being romantic, so I have to give him hints now and then. Point is, we accept and love each other, flaws and all. That's the secret to a long and happy marriage. Talking to mama really helped me understand that no one is perfect, and therefore my standards are unreasonable. I had some apologizing to do. I texted Beavis, Daniel, Eric, and Nina. Beavis replied straight away, telling me he was sorry too for what he said, but it came from a good place, and he's sure that I was better than that because he trusts Patrick's eye for people. Now there was just one last apology for me to make, and I needed to do this one in person. Oh, looks like he already found me. Hey, shoddy. Are you looking for me? The most handsome guy in town. Please stop. I came to talk to you about something serious. Uh, <laughs> I came to see you too. Trust me, I didn't match you with those silly guys on purpose. In no way do I want to hurt you. Because, because I like you, Paige. For real. Since when? I, I just thought we were just good friends. Since we started dating. At first, I just went along with it. But gradually, I found myself having real feelings for you. I'm so sorry for causing you trouble. Being around you makes my head fuzzy. I always crack jokes just because I want to make you smile. But turns out, you don't feel the same. I will try to keep it down from now on. No, I'm sorry too. You don't have to change anything for me. It's the real you after all. I've truly learned it now. Nobody's perfect. And it's the way people complete each other's imperfections with their personality differences that tighten the relationships. And maybe being perfect is my imperfection. So now you have my permission to offset it with your annoying unseriousness. So where were we as a couple? <laughs> oh, right. Pages vomit. Shall we go home and make that signature drink again? <laughs> just kidding. I'd only just arrived at school, yet I could tell something was up. Dude, what's with all the fuss? Did Carl do something crazy again? Look at this. Jeez, gross. Uh, sorry, wrong direction. This way. Here you go, Miss Stewart, the new principal of our school. In front of me was a stern-looking woman who exuded a terrifying aura. Ooh. Well, that was unexpected, as we all assumed that Mr. Smith would take the lead because he'd been serving as school vice principal for pretty much forever. Suddenly, everyone's phone vibrated. Why the stern face? She looks so angry at the world. Is she allergic to our skin? Every skirt is too short, lol. No dance party this year? Unbelievable! Is she a principal or a jailer? Ah, uh, warning you guys, she knows our secret smoking place. Jeez, look at all those faces pinned to their mobile phones. The gossip mongers. Over the next few days, rumors about our new principal seemed to be everywhere. Info about her seemed more sought after than imagined dragons tickets. Also, from day one of the principal's arrival here, a series of bizarre stories began to circulate. One day I was walking into class and heard the most ridiculous story in the world. My school was haunted. <laughs> Idiots. I quietly crept under the table, then suddenly poked my head up and shouted, Boo! Which caused all my friends to jump in fear. Ha <laughs> ha, losers. All that spook stuff is nonsense. You don't believe it, huh? Yet Stacy saw it. Oh no. Stacy? I didn't know they dragged my crush into all these silly gossip things. She's usually a smart girl. Not sure what had gotten into her. 
After that, Stacy lowered her voice and started talking passionately about her chance encounter with a silhouette that appeared in front of the principal's office. But worst of all, before she could get a closer look at it, it vanished. Um, it was probably just the security guard. Nah, when I left, I still saw him dozing off in his room. He even checked the camera and saw Stacy just standing and saying hello, even though nobody was there. <laughs> Creepy, right? Then the story went further, when someone claimed that the new principal was a witch and was bringing evil forces to the school. Oh my god, Stacy, I needed to pull her out of this mess of nonsense right now. But no matter what I said, she insisted. I saw it with my own eyes. What if she really is capable of dark magic? Oh, come on. We're not kids anymore, Stace. Evil forces, witches, demons, they aren't real. But it's you who might get in trouble when the principal starts investigating who's spreading the rumor. Josh, it's driving me crazy. I need to confirm what I saw. <laughs> but I'm scared. Can you come with me, please? I hesitated for a moment, then nodded. Okay, back gate, 10 p.m. tonight. Let's just get it over with. <laughs> Plus, it'd be a great chance to impress my crush, isn't it? That night, I arrived at our meeting point early and waited around. It was freezing, and not gonna lie, I got goosebumps. Okay, calm down, Josh. Ghosts were just tricks of the mind, and it's time to show my future girlfriend how tough I am. As I was deep in my thoughts, a hand suddenly touched my shoulder. Jesus, Stacy, do you know what time it is? Oh, sorry, I'm a bit late. Did I scare you? <laughs> of course not. Uh, let's get inside and end this obsession of yours. But how are we supposed to get in? Stacy pointed at a big hole in the school's fence that was hidden by a bush. We then carefully sneaked through it and successfully avoided the security guard. <laughs> Piece of cake. Inside, the whole school corridor was pitch black, and the streetlight shone from the glass windows. The scenario looked pretty much like a horror movie, but there was nothing to fear, right? I used a flashlight to guide Stacy to the principal's office, when suddenly a loud screech sound made my heart want to stop. Stacy clung to me in fear. Relax, I think it's just the sound of the speakers crackling. Are you scared, Stace? Uh, no, let, let's just go. But then, as soon as the noise stopped, another creepy sound started up. Footsteps. Had the security guard spotted the two of us already? I turned around and there was nothing but an empty space. Just like that, we continued walking, and they walked too. And when we stopped, they stopped. Then, as soon as the footsteps began to rush towards us, I grabbed Stacy's hand and ran as fast as I could to the principal's office and slammed shut the door. Listen, Stacy, the footsteps were probably from the security guard. You see, it, clearly, we're the only ones here, so stop believing in these things, okay? I just finished talking when suddenly the door burst open and... and... I could see a motionless figure standing there. That's him! Holy mother, I was so scared that I closed my eyes and grabbed onto Stacy. Then when I opened my eyes, the shadow was moving towards us. Terrified, I rushed to the door to escape and... Bang! Both me and the ghost fell. Mike, are you okay? Mike? The three of us sat awkwardly on the sidewalk outside the school. I didn't need the chilly wind to make my heart feel frozen. As it turned out, Stacy already had a boyfriend. And that boyfriend was none other than Mike, my best friend. Ugh! So much for me wasting my time playing hero. And if you're wondering why Mike was here, the answer was to help Stacy put on this phantom play. That's right. Both the crackling and the footstep sounds were all made by him. Hang on, why did she make up this ghost story thing? Even prepared a whole play for me and the others to acknowledge it? Stacy explained that it was only because the new principal was too harsh, creating strict rules and making it difficult for the students. Huh? But I don't think any of these rules affect her much. I mean, Stacy had always been a model student anyway. So why did she have to take it to this extent? I asked, but Stacy just ignored me and asked me to keep it a secret. In the following days, people kept questioning me on my late night expedition. At first, I just kept quiet because I didn't want to get involved in annoying gossip and to be reminded of how my best friend turned out to be my love rival. However, rumors about the haunted school spread quickly and reached the press. Fear swallowed the school. A few students even transferred to another one because they were so scared. Although I wasn't a fan of the new principal's strict rules, what Stacy did had gone too far. One day, I was about to find her to figure this out when I saw her walking alone down the exit stairs. Stacy, I know you're the principal's daughter and the admin of the spooky group chat that has been on the rise recently. What? Stacy's the principal's daughter? Unbelievable. 
And wasn't that person Mr. Smith, the vice principal? Perhaps we're after one same thing. Don't you want your mom to work elsewhere too, right? But your method doesn't seem to be working so well. So what do you suggest? There is an easier way, that is. Hand me your mother's seal. I will take care of this. That's too dangerous. How can I trust you? Now that we're on the same boat, you probably don't want your mother to know what you've done behind your back, do you? As soon as Mr. Smith left, I immediately ran to Stacy. No, you can't do that. You don't even know him personally. Be careful. But Stacy insisted on doing it on her own. She said that since her father passed away, she'd grown tired of her mother's rules. School was the only place she used to feel free. But now, that also been ruined for her. I can't live 24-7 under my mother's containment. Do you understand? Well, it's true that being a teacher's child must be stressful enough already. Not to mention being the child of a strict principal. That would surely be even more exhausting. But conspiring with Mr. Smith was a step too far, right? And what will be, will be. A few days later, a ton of messages regarding the principal faking test scores to improve the school's ranking broke out. And of course, she would be subject to disciplinary procedures and may have to quit her job forever for violating professional ethics. I looked over at Stacy. Her face darkened and suddenly she darted out of the classroom. I chased after her and looked everywhere for her but she was nowhere to be found, until I heard a sobbing sound coming from the abandoned canteen. Thank goodness, there she was. Seeing me, Stacy burst into tears and poured her heart out. She could not have foreseen the consequences of her actions, and naively let Mr. Smith take advantage of her and created all this. Stace, I think it's best to tell your mom the truth. There's still time to fix this, quick, before it's too late. She wiped her tears and gave me a hug, then agreed to go find her mom. Mom, I... I'm sorry, I started the rumors and I conspired with Mr. Smith to help ruin your career. I thought the principal was going to go ballistic, but then to my surprise, she came forward and pulled Stacy into her arms. I know things have been tough since your father was no longer with us. I've just been so worried about you making the wrong choices and going down the wrong path that I started to be stricter on you. I love you. I never meant to put this much pressure on you. I'm sorry. Please forgive Stacy. She never meant to hurt you, and she feels terrible about it. Everything's fine. Thank you very much, Josh, for telling me about this. Huh? You already know everything? <laughs> yeah, I was so worried that you would be taken advantage of, so I told her about the conversation you had with the vice principal. As for the rumor that the principal had to quit her job, it was me who spread it. I mean, that's how Stacy realized what she did was outrageous and could have big consequences, right? <laughs> Although her mom forgave her, Stacy was still nervous because she'd given Mr. Smith her mother's seal. It's okay, dear. What you did accidentally helped me to get evidence of his embezzlement by impersonating me. His misconduct will soon be handled. It's all good now. My work here was done. I fixed things with Stacy and her mom. But most importantly of all, I proved that the school's not haunted. <laughs> so, what's next? Well, Stacy must have been so moved by my heroic actions started developing feelings for me. As she broke up with Mike, not long after that, then asked me out. But he's my best friend, and there's no way I'm making him sad over a girl, so I turned her down. Besides, her mischievous side is kind of terrifying. Girls are dangerous. <laughs> uh, 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 why did this fence have to be so high? Oh no, that didn't sound good. It was time to get out of here. But... Ugh! I seem to be stuck! Suddenly, a security team was blinding me with a flashlight and telling me not to move! Not that I could anyway... <sighs> they dragged me down. Then the next thing I knew, I was being pushed into a chair and interrogated by security guards. But all they got out of me was silence. A few minutes later... Mr. and Mrs. Langston showed up. Yeah, they're the wealthy couple who owns this mansion. They're the people that I was looking for. I suppose I did owe them an explanation. I'm sorry for this disturbance, but it's not what you think. I saw your job advert for a housemaid, and I wanted to apply. But the guard said I was too young and refused to let me in. The thing is, my dad has a rare heart condition, and if he doesn't receive treatment soon, then chances are... 
he won't make it. I really don't have any other choice. So please can I have the job and also six months' salary advance? Right at that moment, a girl my age fell into the room, peered at the Langstons, then started laughing. Carla, this is not acceptable. Aren't you ashamed of your appalling results for the Francis Academy entrance exam? You should be studying hard to redeem yourself, not out partying at this hour. This Carla girl just rolled her eyes at them, then wobbly walked off. I noticed Mr. Langston comforting his wife, who seemed to be in much distress at the girl's inconsiderate behaviors. So this must be their daughter then. They sure seem to take her education seriously. And she applied to my school. Hmm, that gave me an idea. You know, if you want to improve Carla's academic performance, I can help you. They both gave me skeptical looks, so I showed them my academic records and told them how I was a valedictorian and had successfully scored a scholarship at Francis Academy. On hearing about my achievements, any apprehensions they had soon faded. And so, they'd come up with a plan. A risky one. They would pay for my dad's hospital fees until he fully recuperated if I took on the identity of Carla and flew to South Korea to study at an international high school there, while Carla would take my place and enroll at Francis Academy just as they wished. This deal sounded like the answer to my prayers, but I knew it would be tricky. Pretending to be somebody else in a completely different country was beyond my understanding, so I agreed to do it, but only on two more conditions. First, a guardian must be present, who would take care of all my paperwork and stuff. Second, after I completed the deal and returned, the Langstons had to help me get into my dream school, the prestigious GBA University, obviously. They gave it a thought, then shook my hand in agreement. It looked like we had a deal! The next thing I knew, I was in an elite neighborhood in Seoul, Korea. Whoa! Talk about luxury! So this was what it felt like to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Mr. Preston dropped me off at school and repeatedly told me not to draw attention to myself. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, Mr. Preston is the Langston's lawyer, and according to the contract, he's also my guardian. He seems oh so serious. But I guess he's okay. Whoa, this school looked so modern. The architecture was a work of art all in itself. I wandered around the endless corridors and tried to find my class. Everyone seemed quite friendly, and the class president, Minjun, even gave me a guided tour. All the students' outstanding paintings, photos, and models were displayed all across the campus. Countless classrooms of different subjects, from science to art just made me gasp in awe. I was admiring the artwork, when suddenly Minjin blurted out, Sorry, I've got to go. Miss Lee is looking for me. It'll only take a few minutes, so wait here for me, okay? Then he rushed off, so I lingered around the hall. That's when I spotted a group of girls nearby. I recognized the one from my last class. I'm sure her name was Isabella. I was about to walk over to greet them, when I realized they had this one girl cornered and were making fun of her hairband. Ugh! Where did you get that horrid thing from? I suppose it must have come from some thrift shop or something. I heard that's where poor people shop. <laughs> Ugh, this whole thing disgusted me. They outcasted someone just because she didn't come from ridiculously rich households like them. Ugh, I knew that poor girl's feeling all too well. I gotta help her, but I didn't want to get anyone's back up and draw attention to myself. Hmm, what could I do? Ah, got it! Hey, the teacher's coming. I'll stall her for you guys. Run! My plan worked a treat, as Isabella and her friends nodded at me, then rushed off. I then went over to the girl asking if she was okay. Get away from me! She flinched me off her and then ran off. Huh? I was only trying to help. As I turned around, I saw Minjin looking at me. A bit impressed, I think. He told me that the students here were divided into two groups. 90% are rich, and the remaining 10% are poor kids entering under scholarships. 
most of the students are quite friendly to each other. Well, except those I just witnessed. Isabella's part of the rich kid group who think their upbringings make them superior to others. She's often mean to the 10% group as she believes they don't deserve to be here. And as you can guess, that girl they upset? She's called Susie. She's in the 10% group. And she's the smartest student in our year. What nonsense! School is school! We're here to study and should all be treated equally. Too right, new girl. I knew there was something different about you. The next day, when class was over, Isabella tapped on my shoulder and thanked me for the warning. Then she asked me to join her group for lunch. I was about to politely refuse when Minjin appeared and asked me to join him. Phew. Thanks to Minjin, I had an excuse to quickly flee the scene. However, I did look back and see that Isabella was giving this offended look. After that, Minjin and I started hanging out more. We soon became close friends, and we both decided that the dynamics around here needed to change. So, we set out to help the 10% club. One lunchtime, Isabella and her clan purposely bumped into this boy, causing him to spill food all over himself. While they laughed and pointed at him, I rushed over there, took the food, and slammed it onto Minjin's face. Minjin immediately understood my intention. Then he also took a handful of noodles and smeared it all over Isabella. Cue the canteen erupting into one big, messy food fight. <laughs> Another time, the school was preparing for a cultural fair. One boy from the 10% group had this awesome idea to open a food stall serving traditional dishes from different countries. Everyone agreed, apart from, yep, you guessed it, Isabella and her snooty besties. Such a peasant. Too used to working as a waiter to serve others, huh? I winked at Minjin. Then we stayed behind and secretly wrote Isabella and her friends' names on the list of participants and submitted it to the teacher. Now, they had no choice but to serve food at the super crowded fair. The funniest part was they finally got a taste of their own medicine when the 10% group made the most of ordering them around and complaining. Ew, this ratatouille is too bland. Add some more salt. And this milk tea is too sweet. Start a new batch with less sugar. I have to admit, I was enjoying watching the mean kids squirm. But I guess my enjoyment hadn't gone unnoticed, as afterward, Isabella approached me. Those peasant kids aren't at the same level as you and I. I suggest you put more care into who you choose to associate with, or you could end up being treated like they are. Whatever. I just rolled my eyes, walked away from her, then continued to hang out with my friends in the 10% group. Isabella and her minions gave me dirty looks, but due to the Langston's name and fortune, that's all they could do. Just like that, my high school years passed by. I had some great friends. And guess what? Yep, I was now dating Minjin. I loved being here in South Korea, and I'd even grown fond of Preston who despite being a grumpy gut, now felt like family to me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I missed my family back home like crazy. But dad was getting better now, and we regularly FaceTimed. As amazing as my life was now, deep down I always felt like I was living in a dream. None of this truly belonged to me, and everything would be over as soon as I left this place. And eventually, my last week here arrived. As I was studying for my last ever exam, the SAT, I received a message from an unknown number. I know your secret. Drop out of the test, else I'll expose you. What? Who could it be? I called the number and a distorted voice answered the phone. I begged them to tell me why they were doing this, but they just replied, You don't need to know. Just do as I said. Then they hung up. Luckily for me, Preston isn't just an amazing lawyer, he's also a tech genius. Thanks to him, we tracked down the location of the phone. Hmm, I bet you're just as curious as I am to find out who it was. And now was the moment of truth. Huh? No way! Standing there looking startled was... Susie! Why would she do this to me? It made no sense. I mean, I know we weren't friends but I had nothing against her. 
Why did she despise me to the point of willing to ruin my life like this? Please let me explain. Ever since you arrived here, I lost my top spot at school, which means I've also lost a full scholarship to college. My family will never be able to afford it themselves, so I decided to investigate you. And that's when I found out that you were not the real Carla Langston, and you got paid by her parents to achieve all these academic records for her. I get why you're upset, but you didn't have to blackmail me. You don't strike me as someone who would do such a thing, so it's kind of disappointing that you did. I'm not. I... I'm a dead end, Irene. You have to understand. This is my entire future I'm losing here. And what for? So some rich, spoiled girl can get into college without doing any of the work? <sighs> it seemed like I had a lot of thinking to do. In the end, I realized all I felt towards Susie was pity. This was all my fault, and it wasn't fair for someone as capable as Susie to have her entire future ruined because of me. So, I had to be the bigger person here. I decided to ask the Langstons to give Susie the spot at GBA University, which was previously reserved for me as part of the deal. I mean, no worries. With this big brain, I could easily get in there on my own, right? And so, as soon as I was done with the test, I quietly left South Korea behind, without saying goodbye to anyone, including Minjin. Susie and I boarded the same flight back to the state. She couldn't help but thank me all the way there. And, well, let's just say, by the time the plane landed, we became good friends. But things didn't all go as swimmingly as I intended. It turned out Carla was even more negligent than first thought. All she managed to get was a high school diploma with shockingly bad grades. These were now my bad grades. My dream of attending a prestigious university was over. <sighs> I just have to make do with a community college instead. A year flew by, and there wasn't a single day that I didn't think about South Korea or Minjin. I couldn't talk to him anymore. I promised the Langstons I'd cut all ties with my life there. I mean, Susie was the exception. One day while going out with Susie, she was showing me something interesting on Facebook. When we happened to scroll past a post of Minjin's, which read, Finally I found you the love of my life. My heart sank. Wow, it looked like he'd found someone else, while my heart still pined for him. <sighs> but life still goes on, and a week after that, I was waiting for Susie outside of her college, daydreaming how this could have been my life. I saw a familiar face heading towards me. Was that... Minjin? But wait! He was with a girl... Carla! Hang on, his Facebook post was about her? The love of his life was Carla? I couldn't do this right now, so I willed back tears as I took a deep breath and turned to walk away. But suddenly, I felt a hand pull me back. It was Minjin. It's really you! I finally found you! I've been looking ever since graduation, and then my information led me here and to... Me! Carla appeared next to him and smirked at me. Hey, who am I to stop the course of true love? So I told him your real name and helped him search for you. I mean, you're smart, so I figured you'd attend this university too. No, you messed up my grades, remember? Anyway, it doesn't matter anymore. I turned and looked at Minjin. I'm so sorry, Minjin. I wanted to tell you everything, but I couldn't. He took my hand in his and gave me this adoring smile. I found you. And trust me, right now, that's all that matters. Wow, this cake tastes like heaven. I reached out to grab another piece when I heard a growl behind me. I told you to be graceful, didn't I? Then Mom pulled me over to greet this smartly dressed couple. Ugh, again. They looked me up and down, then said, I heard that you're a gifted pianist. We would love to hear you play. Huh? Piano? I'd never played it before in my life. Before I could say a word, Mom chimed in. Unfortunately, Phoebe's just sprained her wrist. Maybe next time. I looked at her confused. Why would she lie like that? Jeez. 
Mom, why did you say that I could play the piano? Ah, yes, I may have bragged to them that all of my adopted children are excellent. What can I say? All moms boasted about their kids, right? And yep, I'd grown up in an orphanage before mom welcomed me into her family. This place is pretty grand, huh? I found it overwhelming at first, and ended up getting lost trying to find my room. Luckily, there are plenty of my adoptive sisters around to show me where to go. I do have ten of them. Yep, you heard me right. Ten. It was as if I had just moved from one orphanage to another, only no more orphaned. And we're all similar ages, which is unusual, as foster parents often prefer younger kids. They said us teenagers are rather stubborn. Not to mention how my adoptive dad is never around. Seriously, I couldn't even tell you what he looks like. So it's just us girls here. I got on best with Collins. She's a couple of years older than me, and we share the same bedroom. As much as I liked living with mom and my sisters, mom did make us all do strange things, such as wear cheesy clothes and walk in a straight line. Worse still, she forced me to learn the piano. Ugh, I was not at all musical. I just made a right din. She also taught me how to eat properly, but it did kind of feel like a dog training session. I was only allowed to eat when she showed a signal, and by the time I could catch up with how to use the silverwares, the meal was already finished. Ugh. But I suppose that's how every mom teaches her daughter, right? And apparently, mom didn't have the patience to coach me anymore. So she handed me over to Collins, her star daughter. We spent an hour every day talking together. Or rather, she gave me pointers on how to talk correctly. Collins said I needed to control my volume because I had a tendency to shout my words and it wasn't very ladylike. I had to whisper at the same volume as her and also choose my words carefully to show intelligence and grace. Ugh, maybe it'd be easier if I just didn't say anything at all from now on. Aside from Collins, I didn't have a chance to get to know my other sisters, as Mom made each of us pursue a different aptitude. Then we had to perform for her on our monthly assessment. Mom's overall very gentle and caring, but too strict when it comes to training. So we all have to spend a lot of time and effort in practice. One day, I was trying to make sense of the music sheet when I heard Lexi complain, Ugh, why does Mom force me on this mission impossible? So boring. What? At least ice skating is 1,000 times more fun than the piano. If only. An idea popped into my head. That night, I went to my mom and timidly said, Mom, I want to switch from piano lessons to ice skating. I can exchange with Lexi. I... What? No. But why? Lexi doesn't even like ice skating. Um, well, it's because I can see potential in each one of you, so it's impossible to switch. Frustrated, I went back to my room and began whining to Collins, but she thought that it wasn't a big deal. Mom knows what's best for us. Well, that I'm not too sure about, because yet we didn't even get to go to school. As Mom said, her homeschooling was enough, while I only found her method rather strange. I've dreamed of this perfect life with an amazing mom, but Mom was never very affectionate. It didn't matter how much we studied or tried to perfect our chosen hobby— She never cuddled or praised us, not even Collins, who's the smartest girl here. I was desperate to impress mom, so one time I spent ages making this Portuguese appetizer for her, but all she did was take one bite and say it was okay. I asked her if she didn't like me, but she just replied in a growl tone that she was helping us to have a high position in society and a bright life. But I don't need those things. I just wanted her to like me. This place is so stuffy. And the only time that I can actually breathe is when I'm on my Friday morning bread buying errand. Ugh. Then suddenly someone patted me on my shoulder, which startled me so much I dropped my stuff. Hey, it's really you. But is something wrong with you? Why the strange walk? The only thing I'm good at is buying bread, but now you've ruined it. See? Jet stooped down to pick it up for me. He was still as rude as ever but I still found myself jealous of this free spirit off him. We used to be a perfect match at our orphanage, and quite embarrassing to admit, but I was very naughty back then, and often shoplifted with him. You could go steal some more. Remember our tricks? I have to tell you three things. Firstly, I've been adopted. Secondly, my adoptive family is wealthy. And finally, I'm being educated to be a noble lady, so no more stealing. That's ridiculous. 
I also have three things for you. I've been adopted too. My parents love me so much. Oh, and they're cops. We looked at each other and burst out laughing. So we were both caught, weren't we? Jet and I sat down on a nearby bench to catch up. And when I poured my heart out about my new family, he interrupted me. Sounds strange to me. Why would they only adopt teenage girls? And what are those training lessons and monthly evaluations for? Then, Jet insisted that he would investigate my adoptive family. That's silly. <laughs> but anyway, it's fun to reunite with a friend, and we agreed to hang out every Friday after that. And here comes my first assessment. Of course, I couldn't even play a simple melody, so I had to study for three more hours every day. My sisters suffered even more. Kinsley was forced to abstain from food because she weighed two kilograms more than the standard. In contrast, Willow had to eat continuously at night in order to gain five kilograms. If it's to this extent, then it must have not been simply for the sake of the casual boasting of a mom, right? On the next Bread Friday, I told Jet about last week's assessment. He firmly stated that there was a problem with my family. I don't think so, Jet. Mom just wants the best for us. Listen, Phoebe, I think she trained you guys on purpose. Each of you has to be good at a certain subject, just like the shopping orders. Orders don't go too far. You know Kobe beef? Cows are made to listen to music, given beer to drink, and massaged, but in the end, you know what the outcome is. Oh no. Is that what this is? Mom always said that she would give us the best life as long as we worked hard. Were we being tested and stamped like those cows? One day, I came home to Collins, excitedly packing her suitcase. Mom said she's taking me to a new school tomorrow. So Collins was leaving? But where? I'll miss you, sis. Text me when you get there. But days passed without a word from her. I asked Mom, and she said that Collins' hard work paid off, and she'd been accepted into a prestigious school, but they had a strict no-phones rule. Huh. That sounded sus. So I told Jet, and he insisted I report the case. Another Friday. Jet and I met at a church near the bakery. Huh. Why did he choose this boring place? I was looking around when I saw a group of schoolgirls coming out of the church. They all wore the same dull uniform, had their hair neatly tied back in a bun, and all obediently lined up. Then there I saw her. Collins? I was about to rush over to greet her, but the glare of the woman accompanying her scared me off. This was not right. I'd got to ask Collins what was going on. So I grabbed Jet's arm and went after the group. But they got into a black car and sped away. Maybe they chose this church as a place for their transactions. Smart, huh? They put everyone in school uniforms so no one would suspect them. But seeing those faces, I'm sure they're about to be sent to the black market soon. Black market? The thought alone made me shudder. I had to save Collins. I couldn't let mom get away with this. That night, I tiptoed downstairs to eavesdrop. Okay, I'll deliver her this weekend. Correct. She's 5'7". She can ice skate. Cooking and painting? Of course. I have her trained as required. You won't be disappointed. So the deal goes as planned, okay? See you on Sunday. That's it. The next delivery was Lexi. I checked her room and saw her packing her stuff, a beam of innocent happiness on her face. I quickly texted Jet, and he immediately replied, Just wait at home calmly. Don't act without thinking. I'll figure something out. That night, I couldn't sleep a wink. I was so terrified something terrible would happen to Lexi. So early the next morning, as soon as I saw Mom and Lexi getting in the car to leave, I snuck into the trunk, lay there without making any sound, and sent Jet the location. The car took a long time to stop. Had we finally arrived at the transaction location? When it seemed safe, I carefully climbed out and saw Mom talking to a fastidious-looking middle-aged woman. What did Mom say that made Lexi so panicked that she kept clutching Mom's hand? The woman handed Mom a rather thick envelope then grabbed Lexi's hand and dragged her away. God, where was Jet? I couldn't just sit still like this and watch my sister being taken away. Let Lexi go! Now! Phoebe, what are you doing? Stop it! You're going to sell us, aren't you? I already know the truth. What on earth are you talking about, Phoebe? Furious, Mom pulled me away. Stop! Suddenly, two cops rushed in, ordering everyone to put their hands up. Behind them was Jet, still panting. Turns out they were Jet's adoptive parents. Help me! Mom is trying to sell me and my sister. Seeing that, the other woman quickly explained, No, there must be a misunderstanding here. I'm just helping Gianna's daughter to enroll at my school. Bewildered, my eyes darted from Mom to the other woman and then to Jet. 
In the principal's office, I told everyone why I thought my mom was a human trafficker. They all gasped in surprise. I made you practice that hard just because I want you to get in here, the most prestigious all-girls school, so that you can have a better life. I don't want to go to this school anymore, Mom. She told me all about the harsh rules. This place is terrifying. You can't force your kids to do that. You adopted them, so you have to make them feel safe and loved. Miss Gianna, this is a prestigious school, and it doesn't need your scandal. You led me to believe that your daughters were naturally gifted, which now transpires is all lies. I won't accept any child from your family from now on. No, they're my children. They deserve the best. Then she begged the principal to withdraw her decision, but she firmly shook her head. Suddenly, Mom shouted, Why? I just want them not to suffer like me. So what's wrong with that? Then Mom burst into tears. It turns out that in the past, Mom was in love with a politician. But he decided it would further his career if he chose to marry a graduate from this prestigious school instead. Mom loved him so much, she continued to be his mistress. But despite being fully provided for by him, Mom always felt that she was inferior to his official wife, especially when he proudly boasted about his smart wife and talented daughters. Then, when she wanted to start her own family, he wouldn't allow it. In the end, she decided to adopt girls and train them to become excellent so that they could enter this school regardless of their background. So that's the reason why she did this to us. I have to admit, I did feel a bit sorry for her. All of this was probably just to ease the pain of her past. But mom, we don't want to go to this snooty school. We just want you to love us and protect us. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I was only trying to help. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. And she hugged me. So in the end, my sisters and I finally have a truly happy family. Mom doesn't make us do any dumb tasks anymore. Instead, she lets us pursue our own dreams and passions. Now we all go to a public school and live out our normal teen lives. It's wonderful finally having an amazing mom, incredible sisters, and my pretty awesome best friend, Jet, all by my side. Hi, I'm Donna, an influencer extraordinaire and soon-to-be supermodel. My family are my biggest supporters. Look, there's my sister Charlotte. Even though my parents are busy running the family corporation, they buy me whatever I want. This includes this spectacular dress for the upcoming Elite Model Look Contest. Girls, get ready! We're eating out tonight! Yay! Charlotte just helped Dad secure another business contract, so it's time to celebrate! At the restaurant, Mom, Dad, and Charlotte walked ahead while I showed my 329,587 followers around. My fans even commented that I should compete for Miss USA. Suddenly, someone bumped into me, causing me to drop my phone. Oh no! My live stream's ended, and it's all his fault! Idiot, you ruined my live stream. Now my fans will think I'm rude and unfollow me. Are you walking with your eyes closed? Sorry, I didn't mean to. Let me make it up for you. Donna the Fabulous? Okay, you've just got one more follower. What a jinx. He better stay out of my sight. But as soon as I reached our table, I saw his face again. Why is he here? Donna, this is Matthew, our new finance director. Oh, how important. But not as much as live streaming, right? Who does he think he is? Charlotte even laughed at his stupid joke. Speaking of which, Donna, you're going to study business from now on. Time to stop those modeling, live streaming things. What? But why? You've always supported my dreams before. But Dad just ignored me and chatted with Matthew. Dad was being so unreasonable. Everything was fine until that Matthew guy showed up. Charlotte comforted me and suggested we attend business classes for me while I prepared for the modeling contest. What a brilliant idea! Oh, I love my amazing, quick-witted sister! I then put all of my focus into practicing for the contest. But Matthew kept on disturbing me with his nonsense. He even sent me a picture of wedding rings saying, Are these okay? Think they'll match us? I frantically called him to ask him what all the gibberish was about. Hasn't your dad told you yet? We're getting engaged and taking charge of the company together. What on earth is this guy saying? Since when was I expected to marry some guy I barely knew and take over a business I had no interest in? Dad should have some explanation for this. Upon arriving home, I confronted Dad, but he just sighed and said he was planning on telling me himself. But you can't just dictate my career and who I marry. Donna, I only want the best for you. 
But dad, Donna didn't even attend her business classes and is still indulging in her nonsense fashion club. How can you expect her to handle the company? Oh no, why is she telling him that? Was she trying to help me? She's right, dad. I have no interest in business at all. I can't. If that's the case, then you can start as vice president and get some hands-on experience. And you, Charlotte, you'll be Donna's personal assistant and support her. No! This is not how you want it to turn out. Dad used to love us both, but now he didn't even listen. Ugh, yes, Charlotte, my savior. She would surely know what to do. I can't believe it. I've tried so hard to prove myself, only to have everything given to a simple-minded fool like you. S simple minded that's what you really think of me? Well, I guess I just gotta take my new position to show her how simple-minded I am then. So the next morning, I dolled up and strut to the company lobby under a different name, Miss Vice President. Huh, look at those gawking eyes wishing they could escape from the boring suits. Matthew was there too, and was he laughing? Suddenly, my heel got tangled up in my dress and I tripped over. What a disaster. Matthew offered me his hand and asked if I was okay. Who needs his help? And all the silly chatters? Just wait and see. And by that, I mean now. Matthew introduced me to the company's core members and announced some new strategic goals for the company. ROI, margin, accounts. Jeez, what kind of language is he speaking? After what seemed like an eternity, he asked if anyone wanted to add anything. Aha! Uh -huh. I, of course, couldn't miss a chance to show my leadership. This office is seriously lacking some colors. Violet blinds would be a good start, and some motivational pictures really help boost productivity. Oh, you mean putting up motivational quotes? Oh, please, no. Motivation comes from the all-time fashion greats. You know, Bella Hadid, Tyra Banks, Kendall Jenner. Everyone gawped at me, while Charlotte furiously signaled me to stop. Everyone here is so boring! Ugh, all right, I'll stop then. My first day was then followed by tedious meetings and schedules. Everyone was talking gibberish and making me sign a bunch of papers. But every cloud has a silver lining, and for a foodie like me, that's dinner meetings. These people really know how to enjoy life, don't they? But before I could even have my first bite, they all started asking me about proposal this and project that. Fortunately, Matthew was there to save the day. Honestly, he seems pretty good at his job, and he's quite attractive when focused. Oh yeah, work. I gotta contribute my own talents at work too. So, the next day, I put the sign on my door, then sat back and watched my favorite fashion show. Ooh, look at those dazzling dresses. One day, I'd be walking the runway in a gown like that, not sitting here surrounded by confusing numbers and papers. Later, when I opened the door, an endless line of people was already waiting for me. Jeez, can't this company with all these brilliant brains function without me? Right then, Charlotte came dragging me away. What happened? Oh gosh, I didn't know that my computer was connected to the meeting room's projector, so everyone had been watching Project Runaway with me. Matthew was in the conference room too. Why didn't he fix it? Okay, everyone. We should thank our cute boss for giving us a lot of ideas for our problems. He finished the meeting and let them out, but Charlotte was still standing there fuming at me. Cute? There is nothing cute about it. Don't get any wrong ideas that he likes you. Wait for me, Maddie. What is with that attitude? Oh, right. I've seen the gooey-eyed look she gives Matthew. Does she have feelings for him? Before I could pry further, I was sent to Millen for another stupid meeting. Feeling bored, I watched a fashion show to kill time when someone startled me from my side. I personally think this collection is overrated. Oh, sorry if I scared you. I'm Brian. He then gave me his business card and, wow, he's the CEO of a modeling firm in France. Are you coming to the fashion week too? I wish. I actually came for work. <sighs> oh, what a pity. There's a modeling contest this week. I can tell a true beauty like you is destined for the crown. I missed so many chances to be on the runway. If I make it this time, maybe mom and dad will see how serious I am about modeling. This is too amazing of an offer to refuse. Brian, I'm coming with you. At the show, I made sure my phone was off so I could truly immerse myself in all the glamour of the newest fall collection. Brian then kept his word and took me to the audition. I was super nervous at first, but unexpectedly... Everyone else looked so amateur. Meanwhile, I strutted like a pro, confident that this time I would get an offer. But for now, reality was calling. <sighs>
As soon as I turned on my phone, a zillion missed calls from Dad and Matthew popped up. This screamed trouble, so I quickly got Brian's contacts and returned home. There, Charlotte went all banshee shrieking mode on me, accusing me of being irresponsible and selfish for skipping the important meeting. Dad, if you don't do something about this, Donna will destroy the company you've worked so hard to build. That's right. But instead of yelling at her, you should have been there to help out. I'm so disappointed in you, Charlotte. Oh, God. Charlotte's face turned pale immediately. Dad should be scolding me, not her. Feeling a little bad for Charlotte, the next day I went to talk to her, but it sounded like she was arguing with someone inside. I walked in to see Matthew sitting there with loads of pictures of Brian and me. We're still, in Charlotte's words, it looked like we were dating. A few photos can't change the fact that we're getting engaged. He then grabbed my hand and pulled me outside, leaving a stunned Charlotte behind. How are you so sure that I'm not seeing someone else? It's just a feeling. Or maybe it's just my hope, because I... What did he mean by hope? And holy shrimp, why is my heart beating so crazy? What a day. I thought it was finally over when Dad slammed the pictures of me and Brian down in front of me. He was so mad at me, he decided our engagement would be tomorrow instead of a month, as planned. But I haven't mentally prepared for this. So here I am, at my engagement ceremony, waiting for my fiancé to arrive. <laughs> just kidding. Actually, Brian called me last minute to tell me the best news ever. A fashion brand had chosen me as their ambassador. I needed to fly over for some paperwork. Thanks to him, I successfully escaped the engagement and flew to Milan to meet up with him. Finally, I got to pursue my long-repressed dream in my favorite city and not pay heed to my dad's ridiculous orders. Yay! As I woke up the next morning, I eagerly reached for my phone to call Brian, but... Huh? Where was it? I looked at the nightstand, but my passport, my wallet, and all of my stuff had disappeared. I dashed to the reception asking for Brian's room, but they all shook their heads saying there was no one by that name staying there. Frantic, I used their computer and checked the website for his phone number, but it kept saying error. Then I looked up any information about the contest, but found Zilch. How could he do this to me? I trusted him. Now I'm in a foreign country, all alone, and with no money. What am I going to do? I can't just call Dad to come get me. And neither can I call Charlotte. There's only one person I could contact right now. So I called Matthew, and he flew over immediately. We were walking along the Navili Canal to get some dinner before heading back. I thought he would be furious right now because I ran away from our engagement, but he was just quiet the whole time. So, is it okay for you to suddenly come here? I mean, work and stuff, you know? It's alright. You come first. Everything else comes after. That's sweet of him, but I needed to make sure he didn't get the wrong message. I called for your help, but that doesn't mean I want to get engaged. I'm... I'm not ready to come in. At first, I wanted this marriage to happen, but now I'm not so sure anymore. Oh my. Did me running away from the engagement upset him that much? As we stepped through the door, I saw Mom, Dad, and Charlotte waiting for us. Charlotte instantly bombarded me with her dolphin frequency yelling, saying how much they worried about me, how irresponsible and terrible I was. You should have won an Oscar for your acting, Charlotte. Unfortunately, your partner played you this time. Acting? And what partner? Turns out Charlotte was the one behind all of this. She hired Brian from the beginning to make me look bad in my parents' eyes. She also made sure my engagement with Matthew didn't go as planned. Everything played out just as she'd wanted, but she didn't think Brian's greed would get the best of him. He called Matthew, saying he was holding me for ransom. And during the call, the idiot fraud accidentally brought up Charlotte. We were all too shook to even speak when Charlotte burst out crying. You're right! It was me all along! She's never done anything useful, yet got everything meant for me! Mom! Dad! If you needed someone to take care of the company and marry Maddie, why her? Why not me? You haven't told them anything this whole time? I was still processing everything when my dad sighed and said, I was going to tell you both when the time felt right, but seeing you pitting against each other like this hurts me so much. Actually, Donna, we're not your biological parents. Turns out, Dad was my parents' private lawyer and the company belonged to my real parents, not to Dad. But then, my parents got into a terrible accident, and during their last minutes, they gave the company, and me, over to him. They asked Dad to raise me properly and arrange for me to marry Matthew as a part of their deal with Matthew's parents. Growing up and seeing me so passionate about modeling, Dad was going to let Charlotte run the company and let me live my life how I wanted to. But then Matthew and his family showed up and insisted we get engaged according to the deal. 
Dad had no choice but to respect them and carry out my parents' will. So, my current beloved mom and dad are not my actual family? Worse still, my biological parents had both passed away. Donna, we hope you understand. Though we're not related, we have always loved you as our daughter. This is very hard for us, too. I looked at Mom and Dad, the ones who had always loved and cared for me. Mom, Dad, just like you two. I'm sure my parents would want me to do what makes me happy. Though I am the lawful heiress of the company, I can only do harm to it. So I hope you understand and let Charlotte take over it. She's a better suit than me. That's right. You cannot force someone into doing something they don't like. Neither can you force someone into love. Woohoo! No more boring office job. Instead, I've put all my energy into elite model look. And here I am today. You've got this, Donna. I confidently strutted down the runway with Mom, Dad, and Charlotte cheering from the audience. And when I finished my part, I joined my family and nervously waited for the MC to announce the chosen ones. Samantha Friske, Amelia Davis, and Donna Rossi! Yes! I've made it! I've been waiting for this day for so long! Suddenly, I spotted Matthew coming towards us. Congratulations, Donna. I knew you'd get it. Thank you for coming. I know love cannot be forced, nor should I rush it, but... Whenever you're ready. Donna, will you go out with me? How about... now? It was the middle of the night, when flickering lights and clattering sounds awoke me from the most wonderful dream. Through bleary eyes, I saw my frantic parents peering over me. Sweetie, you have to leave England right now. We've received a death threat. D death threat? What happened? Hurry up and pack your things. We don't have much time. But where am I going? And... And what about you guys? To the US. For now, Elise, you go by the name Chloe Stewarts. Remember, if anyone asks, you don't have anything to do with this family. At least arrange a comfy place for her, will you? Sweetie, I know this is hard, but we'll get you back as soon as this is sorted out, okay? Seeing mom and dad this worried, I tried to keep calm. I told them I'd be fine, and quickly left for the flight. I felt so unsettled about all of this. What would America hold for me? So, here I am, at Phillips Academy and I'll be staying in that room. Hopefully, I'll be safe here for the time being. <sighs> I couldn't stop thinking about what Mum and Dad had said. Who'd want to harm us? Dad owns one of the largest real estate firms in the UK, but he's a fair man who, as far as I'm aware, didn't have any enemies. <sighs> this is all so crazy. I needed some fresh air. But there was a white shadow dangling outside that reads, G Get out? Suddenly, a strong wind blew, making me step back and trip over a... Skull! Why is this here? Then the whole room echoed with this horror movie-like sound. My head was spinning when I spotted something. Ha! These tricks can't scare Elise the Fearless. I was about to destroy this thing, when... Hey, stop! Who are you? Who are you? This is my bedroom! What are you doing in here? This room is not just for anyone. Who are your parents? I... I... I was still trying to steer away from his suspecting gaze when someone knocked on the door. It was a girl named Rita, sent by the school to help me out. She went on and on about the school regulations and boarding rules, but all I could think about was that boy. Any questions? Oh, not quite. I mean, the security here might be a little... questionable. Aren't there any safety measures for the balconies? Actually, this is the only room here with a balcony, and it's quite eerie at times. Be careful. Anyway, here's your schedule for this term. Welcome to Phillips. Eerie. It was definitely a little weird. Is it because of that boy? Is he trying to scare people out of this room? According to the schedule Rita gave me, I have my first football practice today. But why are they all dressed funny? Everyone looked at me as if I was an alien and laughed their butts off. Who recalled that soccer and this football? Ever played it before? Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm in the States now and they have different names for loads of stuff. How embarrassing. Don't sweat it. It's actually kind of cute of you. <laughs> so, what's your full name? We may know your family. Chloe Stewart's from England. Everyone then shrugged cluelessly. What a relief. I'm just a nobody to everyone now. However, Rita wouldn't let me blend in. She insisted my clothes were too sloppy for a Phillips student and dragged me to the mall. I like her, but sometimes she's so enthusiastic. If not a little... too much. Elise? Elise Stone? What are you doing here? Has your family moved to America? Oh no, it's the worst timing to bump into some family friend. I frantically looked around to see if anyone heard her, but... Elise Stone, huh? 
It's impossible to escape her questioning. So I told her everything and asked her to keep it a secret. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell a single soul. I've got your back, Chloe. Suddenly, the whole mall was flocking to the entrance. Our Golden Boys, the top player of the varsity football team. Golden Boys? Is this some sort of K-drama or something? Oh, that's the guy from my balcony. On the way back to my room, I kept wondering what that golden boy was doing on my balcony. When I found myself in a haunted house. What's that? Oh, this buddy was from today's biology class. As I carried the skeleton to the corner, I got caught in some toy spiders. Jeez. Suddenly, there was a streak of light from the balcony. Oh, right. I forgot to close the door today. So this annoying intruder sneaked in. Again. Hey, soccer girl. Impressed. Why are you trying to scare me out? What do you want? Well, I'm right next door and this balcony's always been mine. But since you moved in, I've lost the spot to chill. That's it? I mean, I'm staying here for just the time being and I don't really need a balcony. Plus, the less trouble, the better. If you want it that bad, then you can have it. But only the balcony. Please don't ever come into my room without my permission again. Sure thing. But since it's mine now, you can't just walk into my space either. Deal. That's settled then. This door is now officially the border between us. The next morning, I was carrying the skeleton back to the equipment room. Someone bumped into me and accidentally sent the box flying. Oh no, what a mess. Watch where you're going, you and your stupid thing. You were the one running around. Maybe slow down when you're in the hallway wouldn't be a bad idea. Are you talking back to me? You- Hey guys, chill. Right then, the girl pushed Rita to the side. But someone caught her just in time. Grace, why are you picking on the new girl? And you too, Aaron. Come on, man. I don't care. She better apologize to my boyfriend. Drop it, Grace. Are you okay? I know moving to a new country can be hard, so if you need anything, let me know. I was still flustered by his overly friendliness when Rita dragged me away. You know Jeffrey? No. I literally just met him. Oh, sorry. Jeffrey is actually my boyfriend. But we've not gone public yet. Oh, that explains things. I told Rita to rest assured, as I'm not interested in him. I also found out that he's the head boy. No wonder why he knew everything about everyone, including a newbie like me. But as long as I go by Chloe Stewart's, it shouldn't matter, right? But apparently what matters to Grace, the mean girl, is another story. After that incident, she wouldn't stop playing dirty tricks on me. Oopsie, I'm such a klutz sometimes. Another time, I noticed other students giggling at me in the hallway. I didn't know what was going on until Rita took off a piece of paper and stuck to my back. This was such a grace thing to do. Ugh, can she stop acting like a nine-year-old? But nope. As I was going to class, she threw a snake at me, startling me so much I almost fell over. But thankfully, a hand came just in time to catch me. Jaden! Everyone listen up. Chloe is my girl. From now on, if anything happens to her, I'll be on you, Grace. M my My girl? Since when? Couldn't wrap my head around it, so I decided to ask him that night. Earlier today, why'd you say that? Think of it as a thank you, for letting me have the balcony. It actually means a lot to me right now. Well, okay then, but I wonder what's so important to him out there. Never mind, we had a deal. I'd better just mind my own business. But who would have thought Jaden's statement would bring me so much trouble? I suddenly became the center of attention, especially with those golden boys surrounding me 24-7. I was gonna excuse myself when I heard the girls going primal over Jaden. Of course someone with a goldfish brain like you would forget to eat. Excuse me? I was just trying to finish this book before lunch. Who asked him to bring me food anyway? Great, now these girls had another reason not to like me. The golden boys started to act strangely. And Grace as well. This mean girl now watched over me like a hawk, while her boyfriend Aaron also acted up. Not to mention, Jeffrey always tried to be close to me. Which put me in such a dilemma as I didn't want Rita to get the wrong idea about us. Then there was Jaden, who wouldn't quit acting like my bodyguard. I was enjoying myself at school festival when he suddenly appeared and dragged me out of there. This is getting too much. I'm not scared of some childish tricks from Grace, and I can take care of myself. <sighs> this isn't about Grace. A couple of times I've noticed someone watching you from a distance, and even following you around. I don't think it's safe for you to be in a crowd like that. Was I being stalked this whole time? Is it the same person who gave my family the threat? Did they find out I'm here? Who knows what could have happened if Jaden wasn't looking out for me all this time? That night, as if to confirm Jaden's worry, Dad called me saying they'd received another threat, pinpointing my exact location. Dad sounded extremely anxious and kept telling me to be careful. 
As I was trembling with fear, somebody suddenly banged on my door. Freak out, I broke the deal with Jaden and ran straight onto the balcony. You okay? What's going on? Some- someone's knocking on the door. There's no one there. Are you really that scared? I suddenly realized what I was doing. Oh gosh, this is so embarrassing. But is he... blushing too? I quickly looked to the side, surprised to see all the gear. But what's all this? Are you trying to make bombs or something? No, actually. This is to attract the fireflies. Fireflies? Yeah, they've always fascinated me. I needed your balcony for my project. See that right there? It's their playground. Plus, it's really airy out here. Then he leaned over to switch some knobs on the machine. And suddenly there was a swarm of fireflies lighting up the whole place, creating a beautiful fairy tale like scenery. His secret about my balcony had finally come to light. Literally. <laughs> I don't know what your secret is, but you need to stop being afraid. I'll find out who's behind this. His determination touched my heart, but I still can't help worrying about the mysterious door knocks. Who could it be? Since then, I stuck by Jaden. We were like Spongebob and Patrick everywhere we went. Despite all the death stares I got from the girls, I finally understood why they were going crazy over him. He might seem a little kooky at first, but he's actually so caring and unique. Before the end of the term, the school organized this camping trip for us. I tried to make sure Jaden was always in sight for my own safety. It wasn't an easy hike, as more and more people dropped out except for Jaden, who didn't seem at all exhausted. Is he made of steel or something? I tried to keep up with him and occasionally stopped to catch my breath. But where'd he go? Panicked, I looked around for him, but all I saw were mountains and cold winds blowing at me. Suddenly, I felt a heavy stare on me, but no one was there. I quickly ran and called for Jaden, but someone grabbed me from behind. It was Jeffrey. Without a word, he just dragged me away. Well, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? Sorry, but I gotta do this. I've been waiting so long for this moment. You should ask why fate landed you right in the hand of your enemy. Uh, enemy? What do you mean? Are you the one behind the threat? My parents were, yeah. But now I'm in it too. Blame your dad and his stupid resident project that took away our land. The land that was supposed to be my family's mining area. And now we're going bankrupt all thanks to you. And you know what? The news reached Rita's dad and he's forcing us to break up. But this is our parents' business and I have nothing to do with it. Why are you taking it out on me? Well, maybe if their precious daughter is in danger, they'll do something about it. In danger? What is he going to do? Right at that moment, someone appeared and freed me from Jeffrey's grip. Sorry for leaving you alone, but I needed to know who was behind this. You stay out of this. This is none of your business. You need to calm down. Don't get yourself in trouble because of your parents' mistakes. Jeff, you've worked so hard to become head boy. Are you just going to throw everything away? Jaden's words seemed to touch him as we saw Jeffrey fall to his knees. I'll talk to my dad. I'm sure he could help you guys out with the business. Our families have always been close, and we've got you, Jeff. Seeing Jeffrey break down, I felt bad for him. What he did was awful, but his parents never should have put him in this unfair position. That evening, Jeffrey seemed deep in thought when he suddenly dragged Rita out for a private talk, leaving everyone confused. Grace and Aaron then also left. I took a deep breath and filled my lungs with fresh air, when suddenly all the fireflies appeared in the sky, followed by Jaden. I know this is your call, but if you're willing to stay here instead of going back to England, I promise to take care of you. I looked at Jaden, beaming against the beautiful skyline, and I couldn't help but feel my heart beat a little faster. He was so sweet and caring, but why was he doing this? Did he have feelings for me too? Right then, Rita and Jeffrey came back. Jeffrey apologized for scaring me, while Rita also said sorry for not keeping my identity a secret. What's done is done. Let's just enjoy this gorgeous sight in front of us. The next day, as we returned from our camping trip, we all arrived at the hall for a school notice. But when I arrived, it was just my homeroom teacher and classmates there. We just heard from the principal you're going back to England, so we organized a small party for you. I hope you had a good time at Phillips. Everyone also wished me luck on my journey but Jaden didn't even bother to say goodbye. Suddenly, all the lights went out, followed by the candles, and Jaden. I respect your decision to leave, but I just want to let you know, I really like you, and no matter where you go, I'll be thinking about you. Actually, Jaden, I'm staying here. I already told my dad, but... That's all I want to hear, Elise Stone. I'm still waiting for the day my mom says, 
It's all fake. We're millionaires. This was just to teach you to be humble. But I know that'll never happen. And I'm still humble. But humble as in humble background. Hi, I'm Addison from Colorado. Ever since my dad passed away when I was seven, we've been broke. And mom got irked whenever I asked her for money. So going to this kind of expensive summer camp seems pretty far-fetched to me. Suddenly, somebody snatched the flyer out of my hands. It's Katie and Candace, the resident mean girls. Girls, are you ready for the trip yet? New hair, new nails, new clothes, all checked. What about you, Addie the Batty? Oops, sorry. We forgot that a poor loser like you could never afford to join in. I forced back tears as they burst out laughing, then left. Addison, are you okay? Don't listen to them. I can help. Stay away from me, Layla. Rich kids like you would never understand. I flicked her hand away and ran off. Hmm, let's see. Mom's getting ready for her night shift and didn't seem in such a bad mood. Maybe now is my chance to drop the question. Mom, I need some money for the school camp. It's the last chance to- We can barely afford the rent this month. Do you know that? Find a way to make money yourself instead of begging me, will you? At this age and you're still so unthoughtful. Unthoughtful? Have you ever been thoughtful of me? I hate how freaking poor our family is. And more than anything else, I hate you. I ran straight to my room, packed a backpack, and quickly left the house. It's already 2 a.m., and this snowstorm is only getting worse. I ignored dozens of calls from Mom. There was no way I'd return to that house, ever. Oh, it's freezing. I rummaged through my backpack for my mittens when, oh, Alice in Wonderland, my favorite book. The most beautiful moments in my life suddenly came rushing back to me. It was when my dad read me bedtime stories every night. I'd never forgotten his gentle eyes and warm voice. As I turned the pages in hopes of distracting myself from the storm, my phone notified another call from Mum. I have to tell her not to bother me anymore. Hang on, hospital? My mom had an accident at work? I quickly got on my bike to go there, but the barreling storm threw piles of snow against me. I couldn't see anything! Ah! Oh, is it morning already? Contrary to yesterday's blizzard, everything looks as fresh as spring now. But where am I? Suddenly a giant acorn fell and broke in half in which there was a piece of paper. Welcome to Wonderland? Am I dreaming? Wake up, Addison. Mom needs you. Stop wasting time daydreaming like this. Just then there was a shrill scream. Intruder! Restrain her! Suddenly... Two strange men in uniform grabbed my arms, forced me over to a tiny rose arch, and made me go through it. I peered around feeling awestruck. I was in a huge greenhouse, and a well-dressed man was waiting for me. Hello? I'm Edward, the King of Wonderland. Welcome to my kingdom. Dad? Is that Dad? He looks so similar to my dad that I almost blurted it out. He welcomed me warmly with a table of lavish food. I hadn't eaten since last night, so I couldn't help but dig right in. Only when the clock chimed, I became aware of reality. Mom! I needed to get to her. I immediately asked King Edward for the exit. This land is beautiful, but a monster rules its gate. I don't know how you got here, but if you want to leave, you'll have to bring that monster three valuable items. Three items? I asked. Yes. Let's see what that is. Then Sir Edward approached the glass door and spoke out loud. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the most handsome of them all? Your Highness, you are the most handsome, the most elegant. We wish to be as perfect as you are. <laughs> yeah, if I was you, I'd want to be me too. Now tell me, in order for Addison to leave here, what are the required items? To escape this land, she must acquire one fair lock of Rapunzel's hair, the scarf of Red Riding Hood, and Aladdin's magic lamp. Complete this quest before the clock strikes midnight, or be stuck in this world for an eternity. What? Are you serious? Where am I meant to find those things? Don't worry, I'll send Arthur, my close bodyguard, to accompany you. Just then, a tall, handsome guy about my age appeared. Hey, little girl, there's no time to waste. We need to leave now. Then he threw me a set of clothes and told me to change. After that, we went through the same gate as before. Only this time, it no longer led to a red rose garden, but an underground sewer system. Ew, what are we doing down here? 
It stinks! Arthur didn't say a word and quickly found a staircase leading above ground. I immediately followed him, and there was a busy street right in front of me. I noticed that everyone was looking at something. It was long, blonde hair falling from a skyscraper's penthouse. Huh? Rapunzel lives in the Empire State Building? Ridiculous! We quickly walked over there, but it was guarded very strictly. How can we get in? That's why I told you to wear this. So, we easily blended in with the maids and waiters and entered the tower. Wow, I've never set foot in such a luxurious house. Who are you? Startled, I turned around to see Rapunzel in the Grimm's fairy tales, standing right in front of me. But wait, why does this girl look familiar? Layla, is that you? Oh, goodness. I knew you were rich, but I didn't expect you to live in such a beautiful house. You... you know me? I excitedly showed her our class photos. Layla seemed very interested in them, but she couldn't recall anything and kept asking me to tell her more stories about school. When I was rambling about our friends to her, Arthur turned to me and whispered, You need to carry on the task now. Oh, it's been two hours already. I chose my words carefully to ask her for a lock of hair, and of course, she said yes. But when we were about to leave, she clung on to me. Please stay here with me. Clothes, shoes, anything here you want, I can give it to you. This one? This one also. All of this luxury stuff will all be mine? Yes, of course. Wake up. Have you forgotten what we came here for? Are you willing to give up on seeing your mother ever again for this? I'm sorry, Layla, but I really have to go. My mom's in danger. Then please take me with you. I can't stay in this hideous house anymore. Come on, you have everything on earth here. It's like heaven. No, it's hell. All this stuff is just meaningless. What I need is freedom, school, friends, and being able to do what I want. Turns out, after her parents' divorce, her dad did everything to win custody and kept her here just to make money from her gorgeous blonde hair. I miss mom. I'd rather live in a small, shabby house than this flashy, cold place. I couldn't leave her here. Suddenly, I remembered how Eugene saves Rapunzel in the movie. So after getting Layla's approval, I cut her hair short, and the three of us ran away from this penthouse. We dropped Layla off at school, where her mom was already waiting for her. The simplest things like freedom, friends, or someone who truly cares for us are much more valuable than superficial material things. Sadly, I always craved what I didn't have and took what I did have for granted. Let's go. Why are you still standing here? Huh? We have to attend the class too? Ain't no time for this. We gotta find Red Riding Hood. Without a word, Arthur just dragged me away, eventually stopping in front of a girl wearing a scarf on her head. Here she is, the person you need. I waved at her, but she just coldly looked up and asked, What do you want? Huh? Red Riding Hood was none other than Katie? Um, I'll get right to the point. I really need your red scarf. Can you excuse me? This is Gucci. Do you know how much it costs? It's from even the limited edition. Look at you. You probably don't even have a dime to your name. Yeah, it is true, but... I really need this scarf. I'll do anything you want. All right. Hope you don't regret saying that. Right after that, a luxury car came to pick us up. We stopped at an apple farm, which was familiar to me as it was where my mom worked. Well, I want to bake an apple pie for my mom, so pick me a box of apples. Remember, you have to do it alone. Your friend's out. <laughs> my mom can even pick an average of 12 boxes a day, so one box was just a piece of cake. But who knows her one box was actually a container of 1,000 pounds of apples. Did she want to bake for the whole town? Oh, I'm exhausted. Who on earth could pick apples under this scorching heat for hours? My head started spinning. Losing balance, I fell off the ladder. Luckily, Arthur caught me just in time. Still, your mom does this every day. Can you imagine how hard she works to earn food for the family? Maybe that's why my mom is always tired and cranky. Suddenly, I missed her so much. I finally harvested enough apples and brought them into exchange for the scarf. But Katie still made me choose the 10 most perfect apples out of them. No matter which ones I chose, she gave a dissatisfied scowl. This apple is not okay. Neither is this one. It has a 2 centimeter scratch. You're too much. It's all the same. No way. Everything for my mom must be the best. 
She's sick and I need a perfect pie for her. Then Katie told me that when her mom was pregnant, she found out she was sick. The doctor advised her to terminate the pregnancy for her safety, but she refused and risked her life to give birth to Katie. Hearing that story, my eyes just naturally welled up with tears. What now? Are you tired from this little bit of work? No, I just miss my mom so much. I really want to get back to her. I realize that even Katie, the heartless, mean girl, still loves her mom this much. Yet, all I do is ask and plead with my mom. I'm such a terrible child. If you love your mom that much, you know what to do from now on. Help me deliver this gift to your heroic mother, will you? And here. Take it and complete the mission. Finally, we've arrived. Our final destination is a museum. Arthur said that there will be a secret room with the magic lamp, but getting the key to that room was already a hassle. There were security lasers all over the place, so we broke in through the ventilation system. Arthur tied a rope around my waist and then slowly dropped me down where the key was. Just a little more and I got it! But as soon as I touched the key, a drop of my sweat fell, causing the alarm to go off. The guards rushed in from the door, but fortunately, Arthur pulled me up in time. We got out of the ventilation system, but this place was like a maze. Then Arthur pulled me to hide behind a wall. Little by little, his face was getting closer and closer to mine, and my heart was pounding like crazy. Suddenly, the whole wall behind me moved. Turns out there was a secret staircase leading down to the basement, and it took us no time to find the room. Huh? Where's the magic lamp? Arthur approached the only object in the room. It's a projector. He turned it on, then on the white wall appeared the image of my mum, being tired after a long day of work. But when she got home, she still came to check if I was sleeping well. The image of her waking up early to make me my favorite breakfast. Above all, she totally knows about the camping trip and is trying to work overtime so I could join it. Time is running out. You should hurry to go back and hand in these items. I tried to regain my composure, quickly wiped away the tears, and left with Arthur. I'll be back with my mom soon. I'm back! Please take me to the gate! Suddenly, a chiming sound got me frozen. I'm sorry, but time's up! You failed the quest. But why worry? It isn't so bad here. You'll have everything you could ever want. At any cost, please lead me to that monster. I don't need anything else. I just want to be with my mom. I've been thoughtless all this time. I can't leave her when she needs me most. Actually, there is no monster here. It is the greed, selfishness, and ingratitude inside of every one of us. But I can see... You already defeated your monster and learned the lesson. So, you can go back to your mom now. Huh? Everything was so bright. Where was I? Honey, you're awake, thank goodness. Someone squeezed my hand. It was mom. Mom told me how she'd collapsed at work due to overworking. Then she found out I'd fallen off my bike in the snowstorm and knocked myself unconscious. Here you go, sweetie. My mom placed some money in my hand. Now you can go on the camping trip. I'm so sorry for upsetting you. And I promise I will work extra hard so you don't have to go without. I burst into tears and shook my head. I don't need it. I don't want you working overtime and putting your health at risk for me. Having you healthy and by my side is all I need. Mom, please forgive me for everything. As we pulled apart, I noticed someone standing in the doorway. Arthur. Turns out, it was Arthur who rescued me in the snowstorm. Thank you so much. You're my knight in shining armor. Anytime. I'm just glad you're okay. I mean it. I wouldn't have completed the tasks without you. Huh? What tasks? Looking into his dreamy eyes, I honestly felt like he'd been sent by my dad to help me learn from my mistakes and be grateful for what I had. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just glad you're here. How is it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. 
Here comes my chance! Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his mates just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is. Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting, and coldly said, Work off your debt? Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out, he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of ten feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? Ah! Rats! There's a rat! Help! What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and his every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea, but he missed it and tea spilled all over him. Clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Wanna come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there. And werewolves too. As horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind, Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So, ta-da, I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but where is he? Should I? I open the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him, still he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly, his eyes opened. Hey, the ten-foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought, if you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new maid again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you. Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. 
We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly, he's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but ouch! I tripped over a rock. Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops, awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. Wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph! Please don't do it! Ah, my arm! Realizing that he'd just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay. It's okay. Calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with a strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk, and when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But, of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster. Just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it, and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we noticed a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't, because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power-boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away. So the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it, when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. But Jocasta, with you by my side now, 
Anything feels possible. Hi! I'm Kaylee from Washington. I might dress like a boy, but I'm actually the girliest girl you could ever meet. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I was born with shiny blonde hair and blue eyes, just like my mom. I never met my dad, but it wasn't really a big deal. There's no need to live in some fancy castle to feel like a princess. I was already one in my mom's eyes. She always pampered me with the cutest things in the world. You could give Rapunzel a run for her money, sweetheart. But tragically, mom left me in an accident when I was 10, and I had to move in with Selina, my mom's friend. She lived in a mansion where there were so many people dressed just like her. As soon as they saw me, they started to ooh and ah at me. What a porcelain doll. Bet she'll win any beauty pageants. She's just too lovely to be real. Shh, Miss Sanchez here doesn't like anyone who's prettier than her daughter. Yeah, she's been in a foul mood ever since the master left for his mistress. I only caught a bit of what they said before Selena dragged me into a corner. Sweetie, you heard them. Boys are bad news. Just look at your dad, for example. So stay away from them. Got it? Um... And the only way to repel them is if you look more like them. Then she told me to wear contact lenses to hide my blue eyes, cut my long locks, threw away my dress collection, and bought me clothes that basically drowned me. And voila, I look just like a teenage boy. One day, I was alone in the kitchen when I heard someone shouting, Bring me two smoothies now! I brought in two avocado shakes, but accidentally splashed one all over this girl's face, turning her into Shrek. Watch what you're doing! My daughter's angel face is destined to be Miss USA! How dare you! I, I'm sorry, ma'am. Relax, mom. Avocado face masks are all the rage anyway. Sadly, I still had to take my punishment, but suddenly the girl walked towards me. Hey, I'm Beatrix. Let's go and play. But I'm... Don't worry, I'm here. My mom won't punish you anymore. Then, she took me to her room. Wow, she even has a castle inside? Beatrix then put some wigs and makeup on me. I looked at myself in the mirror, and memories of my mom came rushing back. I quickly pulled out the photo of her that I carried with me all the time. We looked so alike. I was about to take my lenses out when Selena stormed in and dragged me back to my room. Don't you ever let me catch you here again, and keep your distance from Little Mistress. We're not from the same world as people like them, remember that? But little did Selena know, Beatrix had just asked her mom to allow me to go to school with her. And ever since then, we've been literally inseparable. I mean literally. She clinged to me from living room to kitchen, from home to school. Honestly, the only time I could have a moment of peace was when I went to the restroom. Phew. Oh, maybe not. And each time we hung out was more than torture. I had to fight against the urge to act girly, hit my own hands whenever they started to reach for those pretty things, and now they ended up swollen. Think I'll glue them in my pockets next time. Then, one day, I arrived at school to the most terrible news ever. Kaylee, one of our female rugby players got injured, so I put you on the team. What on earth? I don't even know what rugby is. Here's Austin, your rugby coach. If you need anything, he's your guy. You know him? He might be handsome, but something about him screams bad news. People call him Awful Austin. You better watch out. And she wasn't exaggerating at all. On the very first day, he already pushed me to my absolute limits in training, that I almost passed out. In the agility ladder exercises, I got my feet tangled up in the line and fell to the ground. But instead of a hand, all I got was his soulless look. Then one time, I missed the ball, causing it to hit another player. Hey, is this a joke to you? Do it properly. Keeping all Celine's words in mind, I zipped my mouth up and ignored him, who was definitely a boy. Oi, what's the attitude? You're bringing the whole team down. See? Cat got your tongue? Faking dumb doesn't work here. From tomorrow, extra training. No excuses. Beatrix was right. He was a devil. I was dragging my aching body home after training. When I noticed a cute cat and stopped to pet it, the cat ran away, so I followed it, and ended up at the back gate of the school, which was totally off limits. I've never been here before. Whoa, look at this beautiful mural. It's so mesmerizing. What you doing here? Awful Austin? Um, I just... Anyway, did you paint this? It's amazing. Of course not. Stop prying. He was such a terrible liar. But to be honest, I didn't expect some jock like him to be interested in art. 
let alone actually be good at it. What are you two doing here? Don't move! Oh no, the guard has spotted us! Austin immediately grabbed my hands and started running. We hid in a small alley, and he pressed me against the wall with his strong arms. My heart was racing like crazy, and I could feel his too. We were so close that our faces were only inches apart, and the warmth of his breath made me blush even more, so I accidentally let out a squeal. <coughs> Thankfully, before things could get any more awkward, the guard was gone. Don't even think of breathing a single word about this. Weirdly, this time his words didn't hurt at all. Maybe because I knew, beneath his tough jock exterior, he had his own secret, just like me. I like your painting, so no need to hide it. Austin stopped for a bit, then kept walking, but I'm sure I caught a smile. After that day, he started to behave quite differently, more gently. He no longer went berserk at me, but helped me get through the training instead so I could catch up with the other players. I just had my first successful kick. Yay! I turned around to cheer with Austin, but out of nowhere, the ball came hurtling right at me, and he instantly caught it with one hand, while the other held me by the waist. Okay, that was awkward. This week, there'd be a senior prom at school, and Beatrix insisted we go. Of course, I gave her a no, but she was literally a leech, so I had no other choice. Wear this, Kay. It's a matching set. It'll be so lame if I wear this alone, please. Fine, but only because you've given me no choice. Yay, love ya! Eek! Wow, it smelled so good. What if I put it on? But wait, what about Selena? Forget it. It's not like she'll be at the prom. YOLO! I stepped into the ballroom with this gorgeous outfit on, my blue eyes, and the necklace my mom gave me. Everyone jaw dropped as soon as they saw me, and that's when I noticed Austin coming towards me. Hey, you look different tonight. Uh, I mean in a good way. Wanna dance? Sorry, girl's time. Kaylee, look at the tasty food corner. Told you we had to come here. Oh, Beatrix, my friend here is starving. Can you show him where to grab a bite? Wow, sure, handsome. We have cupcakes, biscuits, uh, and even brownies. Isn't this called choosing boys over friends? <laughs> good for her, anyway. <laughs> Then Austin gently led me in the waltz. He looked exactly like a prince from a fairy tale. As we fell in step, letting the rhythm control our movements, I felt my whole body tingle. The sparks were definitely flying. But suddenly, the music changed into trance. We looked into each other's eyes for a second. Then, hand in hand, ran across the crowd until we got outside. I could never imagine a tomboy could become like this. Actually, I'm not a tomboy. What do you mean? That's when I decided to tell him everything about how I was obsessed with girly things, but had to suppress it all my life. It felt so good to let it all out after burying it the whole time, and Austin was such a good listener. Wow, Kaylee, I'm so sorry. Actually, I've also had to hide my passion for arts to help my father's business too, so what you said to me the other day really opened up something in me. So things were not easy for him either, huh? Suddenly, he pulled out a sketchbook and started drawing me. I wish this moment would last forever. His face then went all serious, but not in a cold way as usual, but instead, beaming with passion. Our eyes met, and I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. And yes, I hoped this moment would last forever too. Then suddenly, he leaned closer to fix my hair. I was ready for a kiss. Then, Kaylee! Selena? How did she find out about this? Man, you know what's coming next. I can't believe you'd be this reckless! You're not my mom! And not every boy is like my dad! You were wrong! Mind your manners! Get changed! Now! Right then, Mrs. Sanchez came to interrupt us. Hang on! Are her eyes... blue? And what's this? Uh, um, don't mind her. I bought this half price at the swap meet, ma'am. Then she signaled for me to flee the scene. If mom were here, she'd understand the way I feel. Blinking back tears, I suddenly felt a warm hand on my shoulder. Are you alright? I saw you leave with Austin. Did he cut your hair? It looks shorter. I'm okay, Beatrix. Oh wow, I have a similar necklace that my dad gave to me. This was from my dad too, except that I don't actually know who he is. Maybe your dad is my dad? <laughs> Zero for the joke, Beatrix. Oh, but why did Selena lie about the necklace to Miss Sanchez? So I went to find Selena right after, and she told me the most shocking thing ever. Beatrix's dad, the former master here, was actually my dad. He seduced mom, who used to be a maid here too. When Mrs. Sanchez found out, both of them were kicked out of the house. 
Then knowing Mom was having me, he dumped her right away. Selena was afraid Mrs. Sanchez could see Mom in me, and so she had to force me to disguise myself. Wow, this was seriously messed up. Keep your identity a secret by all means or we're doomed. Understand? I was in complete shock, but I knew I had to be more careful from then on. For the whole week after, Mrs. Sanchez seemed to be in a good mood. One day, she even asked me to go shopping with her. But a wedding dress studio? Is there a wedding coming, ma'am? Yes, and it's yours, you filth! You have to pay for your mom's karma for stealing my husband! So she knew everything? I tried to bolt away, but immediately got caught. Then she took me to this luxurious house, and guess who I met? Kaylee, what are you doing here? Uh, Austin? W what? What do you want? I was still bewildered when a man pushed a boy in a wheelchair into the living room. Hi, Mr. Fisher. About our arrangement. This is the bride here. She and Ivan here will make the perfect couple. Hope you like this gift as my thanks for your favor. My blessings for the marriage and your family. Dad, what is she talking about? Ivan will get married to this girl. I've already settled everything so that Ivan can have a bright future without worrying about anything. Excuse me? I've had to put aside my art dream to enroll in business school, as you wished, and now you want to control my brother's life too? I object to this marriage, because I love her! Then he pulled me away, leaving Mr. Fisher frozen in shock. Kaylee, I'm so sorry you had to meet my dad in such an awful way. I promise to never let anyone treat you like this again. No worries. I have to thank you instead. Your words really woke up the courage in me. Austin offered to help me talk things out, but it's time for me to fight for my own good. I came back home to see Mrs. Sanchez flying into a rage. How dare you bring your face back into this house! You cruel woman! I will not marry someone else just to pay off your debt! Right at that moment, Selena walked in, and she literally turned into a bull. How dare you do that to my child! I had to stop her from lunging towards Mrs. Sanchez. So how about what you all have done to me? Do you know what I've been through all these years? Her mom stole my husband, and you just expect me to put it aside? Then, she collapsed and burst into tears. Suddenly, I felt bad for her. I'm sorry for everything that happened to you, but it doesn't mean you have to punish yourself with it, or grant yourself the right to dictate others like that. She owes you nothing, and you have no right to control others' lives. Right after that, Selena and I packed our stuff and left the house. Walking through that door, we felt more free than ever before. After all that drama, it took us some time to get our lives back on track. From all the money Selena had saved working as a maid, she was able to open her own bakery and take back control of our lives. And so do I. Finally, I'm back to my princess style. But after all those craziest things happened, something never changed. Oh my god, oh my god, we're half-sisters! Yay! Ah, uh, my mom said she felt so guilty about what happened, but asked me to keep it a secret. Oops. And about that guy, you ask? He worked things out with his dad. And guess what? He's in art school now. Okay, now tilt your head to the right. Yeah, like that. Gosh, that dress makes you look like a fairy princess. Who dare to make a princess stay still like a statue for more than one hour? Huh? The charming artist? Shh, it's almost done. I beg your pardon. I was in this romantic dinner date with the love of my life, knowing too well that one day I'd be gone. But I couldn't help but falling for him. I'm in love with you, and I know that love is just a shout into the void, and that we're all doomed, and that there will come a day the sun will swallow the only earth we'll ever have. And I am in love with you. Cut. Excellent, Eleanor. Well, that was the usual in the life of an actress. Oh, hey, didn't catch you there. I'm Eleanor, from L.A. My life as a kid was a bit different from others. While they were surrounded by dolls and toys, I was wrapped up in the limelight. Being a superstar seemed fun back then, but the glitz and glamour of showbiz gradually wore me out. My momager never let me take a break between gigs, so there's no time to hang with people my age. You know, I missed out on doing normal things like having sleepovers and going to birthday parties. And before I knew it, I was already swarmed with work and work. Sweetheart, I've got you another script. Take a look. Whatever, Mom. FYI, Jeremiah is also on the show. Seriously? Mom, that heartless jerk cheated on me. No way am I working with him. Eleanor, be professional. I've already signed the contract. Besides, 
Mommy's Bentley collection is missing this shiny golden one. I don't give a damn about your stupid car. Stop treating me like a GoFundMe for your lavish lifestyle. Mom can be insufferable sometimes. She dictated everything. But why bother now? No showbiz, no mom's orders. I can do whatever I want. Bye-bye salad and hello chocolate cake. But suddenly, a dark figure bolted towards me and snatched my bag. I lost my balance, banged my head on a fire hydrant, and then everything went black. Gosh, my head was spinning. I opened my eyes to see a cute guy leaning over me. Hey, are you alright? Am I dreaming? Because this view sure is dreamy. <laughs> no, you're not. You're at the orphanage. I found you unconscious on the ground last night, so I brought you here. Excuse me? An orphanage? I can't be in a place like this. But wait, my phone and wallet? Darn it. That thief stole my bag along with everything. Guess I needed to delay my independent life plan just a little bit. I better call mom. Hey, got a phone I can borrow? Suddenly, the TV broadcast a missing report. The young actress Eleanor Mitchell has been reported missing. Speculation is that this is a publicity stunt to promote her latest movie. However, her manager claims this is not true and urges anyone with information to come forward. Huh, that chick will soon reappear when she's hungry. What? I could be lying dead in a lay-by for all they knew and they were still mocking me? I was so done with this. Goodbye, showbiz. I was leaving that fickle world behind for real. So, I asked the orphanage's manager if I could stay here and help out. Just then, a group of kids noisily ran towards me and printed their hands on my shirt. No! My custom Chanel! Sis, come play with us! Uh, do I look like a nanny to you? Go wash your hands, dirty children. Shoo! Shoo! Ahem, <clears throat> you're supposed to go play with them? Ah, I forgot about that. I steered away to find another group of kids splashing mud everywhere. Ugh! Are they training a bunch of farmers or something? The next morning, this strange screeching noise startled me. It's only 6 a.m. I sluggishly dragged my feet out of the room. People immediately threw me judging looks. I guess my first day at work started off on the wrong foot. I barely had time to sip my coffee before they made me do the washing by hand. This wasn't the dark ages. Hadn't they ever heard of a washing machine? One of the staff got annoyed with me and shooed me away. Alrighty, I'd go help in the kitchen. Peel half of these. Easy peasy. Just give me a few minutes. Voila! I'm good, right? But somehow, they still got mad at me. No other choices. I headed to the children's, but this place is pure chaos. I sure wish I had my earplugs. Suddenly, I felt someone grabbing my leg. I looked down to see the cutest pair of puppy eyes. Sis, can I have a bite of that? Aw, how could I say no to that? But as soon as I gave her the cake, her face changed into a devilish grin. The little girl grabbed a big chunk with her bare hand, then smashed it into another kid's face, and the cake fight began. Caleb opened his mouth to say something, and a massive piece of cake flew into it. Oh my god, Caleb, are you alright? I, I didn't know they were gonna mess with the cake. You did this? Oh, you're so dead to me. He grabbed the cake and started chasing me across the room. What? This was so unprofession- Right, that's it. Watch out, Caleb! Okay, so the manager wasn't very happy with us, but honestly, it was the most fun I'd ever had. Besides, after the cake fight, the kids seemed to like me. Whenever they saw me, they clung to my legs and begged me to play with them. One day I was in the garden attending to the flowers, when this little girl ran over to me in tears. Oh, Pumpkin, what's wrong? Bella was adopted a few days ago, but they just brought her back. Poor kid. All I could do was pull her into a warm embrace and pat her back. Do you know what it is these kids crave the most in the world? Not new toys or expensive clothes. They just want love. Love? I never thought something so simple could seem so unreachable to these kids. Well then, this Eleanor will make sure they'll be showered in love from now on. There's still some troubles, but luckily, I had Caleb on hand to help. Then one night, I was sitting outside looking at the skyline when Caleb came over. He leaned across me and pulled something off my cheek. Oops, the kids must have stuck it while I was asleep. <laughs> That's on you for giving them a sticker book. <laughs> um, Eleanor, I, um, I'm glad you're here. I, I really like you and I'm falling in love with you. Will you be my girlfriend? Wow, I wasn't expecting that. But Caleb was a great guy, so being with him made sense, right? And the following days were fantastic. We found out lots about each other. Oh, there's something you might be surprised about me. I used to be an actress. 
Oh, I didn't expect that. I just think showbiz is kind of toxic. Sorry you feel that way. But believe me, I have no interest in it anymore. Good, because it's all a load of pretentious jerks who think they're so much better than everyone else. Hmm, that's harsh, I guess, but he's right, though. Anyway, I've already found fairy tale love right here. But to be honest, I did miss the elaborate sets, the stunning costumes, the dazzling studio lights, and the feeling of morphing into a different character. So sometimes I played out Disney princess roles for the kids. But one time, Caleb stormed in on us. Look at you! You've fallen back into your old ways. Come on, kids. You have better things to do than this. My heart thumped in sadness. Acting was a part of who I was, but seems like he'd never understand that. And I don't want to upset him either. So I guess I had to put aside my passion and just focus on my new life here. One day while skipping towards the playground, I slipped on a banana peel and was about to fall when a strong arm caught my back and helped me to stand up. Surely he did have a strong build and a gentleman manner. But who is this guy? I thanked him, but he just stared at me. You look just like Eleanor Mitchell. Well, I am her. Oh, you left showbiz for real? I thought it was just a media trick. Huff, what was his deal? Was he a reporter coming to dig up dirt? Oh, sorry, just kidding. But are you serious about quitting acting? You've got talent. All you need is a good script to sink your teeth into, instead of those terrible ones you've been given. Huh? Was that considered a compliment? Turns out, he's Frederick, a young screenwriter who came to the orphanage for inspiration and to help out. He even set up a mini theater for the kids to have their first cinematic experience. As you can see, anything's possible in movies. Even our most magical dreams can come true. I suddenly remembered why cinema had captivated me in the first place. It opened the audience to multiple perspectives and worlds. This is the cinema I love and dream of being a part of. And maybe that's why I'm naturally drawn to Fred. He might seem a little playful, but when it came to movies, he turned into another person. I cannot deny that my flame for acting was rekindled by his genuine sharings. I mean, everybody loves Fred. Look. Well, maybe not everyone. Okay, kids, but remember, studying is priority so that you can have a better life. Acting and script writing is just a pipe dream. It's not real. Yes, studying is important, but arts are what we live for, what nurtures us from within. Art has no value. Investing money in arts is like throwing it out the window. There are people who barely have anything to eat. Why not use that money to help them instead? Gosh, these man-children. They looked ready to start a fight, so I had to step up and stop them. After that day, Caleb and Fred were constantly giving each other dirty looks. I tried to calm Caleb down, but he got mad at me for no reason. Things only got worse between them, and I felt awkward with Fred. Just let him be. I don't want his problems to get in between our friendship. By the way, I have something for you. Then he showed me his new script and asked me for advice. And guess what? The script was actually based on my life in the orphanage. He'd been inspired by my journey here. It was such a beautiful script, and I felt seen and understood, though we just met not long ago. Then out of nowhere, Caleb angrily bolted towards us. What the heck are you doing? He tried to drag me away, but Fred stopped him. Dude, can't you see you're hurting her? Not your business. Get your dumb writing hands off of her. Stop, Caleb, you're being rude. I'm not done with you, Eleanor. You went behind my back to swoon for this brat and his dumb art. I thought you'd be different, but you're just like them. Once a spoiled actress, always a spoiled actress, huh? So this is how little you think of me? Caleb, listen, acting is what I live for. I even tried to hold it back just to please you. And look where it got me. I'm done hiding my true passion. Caleb, we're over. Caleb looked down and didn't say a word, and after that he packed his things and left the orphanage. It's true Caleb had opened up something in me, but if being with him meant I had to lose myself, then I'd gotta let him go. The orphanage without him was not the same. Luckily, I had Fred to cheer me up. He asked me to play the lead in his upcoming film project, and with the script based on my journey here, I agreed. It felt good knowing I could finally go back to acting, even if I was sorta playing myself. Then one day, I found a baby left in front of the orphanage. Then I quickly carried him inside. Poor Hector. I'll take good care of you. Mama. That's right. Your mama's here. Dada. I'm your dada now? Together we'll be a happy family. Right, mama? Oh boy. It made my stomach do cartwheels. But was it okay to feel this way after everything happened? We started filming in the orphanage soon, and the kids were a big help. It felt quite strange after a long break. But the thing that got me nervous about was the audience's reaction to the movie. Turns out, I was worried for nothing, as the feedback was actually amazing. Though that joy didn't last long, as a few days after, the image of me holding Hector hit the internet with the headline, Actress Turned Teenage Mum. 
through their words, I appeared as this reckless girl who got pregnant and ran away from showbiz to give birth. That got netizens turned 180 and throw shade at me. What a load of nonsense. Right at that moment, I got a text from Caleb. Is this your rotten showbiz? So it's him who leaked that picture to the press. How could he? I've got to sort this out. Today's the day. It's time to shed light on everything. Hi everyone, today I have an announcement to make. It's true, I have a baby now, and the father of my child is Jeremiah Williamson, my ex. Everyone gasped in shock. Just then, a man in black stood up and revealed himself. Ha! The prey fell for the trap. You, you liar! Everyone stop listening to her lies! Oh yeah? Then Jeremiah, why exactly are you here? He was completely speechless. That's what I thought. Now, Joshua, Jeremiah's private detective, may you please stand up. Among the crowd, both Caleb and Fred forced the detective up to his feet. Tell them what you know. The deal was Jeremiah felt humiliated as I'd refused to work with him, so he decided to hire this Joshua guy to dig dirt on me. That's how he got my picture with the baby. Luckily, Caleb caught the detective sneaking around the orphanage, and together, we set up the trap to lure Jeremiah in. Jeremiah still insisted he had no idea who this Joshua guy is until I showed the evidence of the transactions between him and his detective on the big screen. Any last words? Justice served. Let's see how he handles this scandal. Right at that moment, I spotted a familiar face in the crowd. Mom! I, I hadn't seen her for such a long time. Darling, I'm so sorry. I realize now how terribly wrong I've been. I thought I was helping, but turns out I only smothered you. But you're ready to make your own choices. Please forgive me, and don't leave me again. I'm sorry too, Mom, for leaving like that. I didn't mean to worry you. I threw my arms around her, tears welling up in my eyes. My time in the orphanage has taught me a big lesson. Family isn't always perfect, but they're the most precious thing in the world. Later, I stepped outside to see Caleb waiting there. What a mess. <laughs> Thank you for helping me. Don't mention it. Actually, I should apologize to you first. That day I couldn't control my words because I was jealous. I'm sorry. And one more thing. I still have feelings for you, so can we... I know what you're about to say, but I've come to realize that we're not right for each other. I think I'm in love with someone else. Thank you for being kind to me. I could see the disappointment on his face, but then he gave me an understanding smile. Out of nowhere, the kids jumped out at me and insisted I go to see their paintings. They took me back to the orphanage and each held their own drawing. Hi, Eleanor. You're the most special girl I've ever met. Will you be... My girlfriend? Fred appeared in front of me and held out a rose. So, Eleanor, what do you say? Oh, wow. What do you think, kids? That answers then? Yes. Yes, I will. Aha! A snowstorm's coming! Perfect for a race. Let's go, my loyal soldiers! Looks like a big storm, guys. Shall we head home? Scared already? Cowards! I was born and raised in the snow. This is nothing! Then I signaled for Bam and Holly to speed up, but they stopped and barked nonstop instead. Is that pile of snow moving? I hurriedly ran over to check. OMG! It's a boy! No, an angel with blonde hair! My heart was racing. Is this love at first sight? H help me. No matter how much Eldon and Era objected, I insisted on bringing this guy back to my place. I had to take care of him myself. Oh, looks like he'd woken up. Are you okay? Where am I? You're in my house. I'm Brenna, by the way. I found- Oh, God. Huh? What's wrong? Something on my face? Um, no. It's just that you're too beautiful. Like a real-life Snow White. Then he said his name's Beavis. He came here to travel, but unfortunately was met by the snowstorm. Yeah, it's gonna snow heavily in the next couple of days, so you should stay here until you recover. After a few days, Beavis got better, so I showed him around. On the sledge. Although Bam and Holly were practically just walking, Beavis still freaked out so much, he huddled up against me. <laughs> Hold on tight! I'm speeding up! We went up a hill, then through a pine forest, and arrived at, ta-da, probably the biggest frozen lake he had ever seen. I taught Beavis how to drill a hole in the ice, then he excitedly dropped the fishing line. The following days, I continued taking him sightseeing, and we were basically inseparable. We went to see polar bears kayaking among the icebergs. I taught him how to make instant snow by spraying boiling water into the cold air, and we even watched the spectacular auroras together. 
Wow, I've never seen such beautiful scenery before. Yeah, and I'd never seen such a beautiful face before. Just like that, Beavis spent day after another with me here in the Arctic. It's been so much fun, but for some reason, my friends Elden and Era were not having any of it. They seemed to hold grudges against him or something. One time when I was arranging supplies in the root cellar, I heard Beavis' ear-piercing scream. I hurriedly checked and saw a white fox dashing out, followed by giggles outside the window. You're such a chicken, big city boy. It's just an extra-large kitty. Then Elden and Era burst into laughter. Ugh, can those two show a little hospitality? At dinner, I cooked him my signature dish as an apology to Beavis for those naughty friends of mine. He was totally cool about it and even told me stories about his friends back at home and about their lives in Florida. Whoa, it sounds so magical. I wish I could lounge around on a beach and soak up the sun while enjoying my coconut drink too. I went to sleep dreaming about the beautiful urban life. Suddenly, a knock on my bedroom door woke me up. I stumbled to answer it and saw Beavis. Hey, Brenna, could you take me to the toilet? It's too dark outside and that fox might come back. <laughs> How cute! He's really good at coming up with excuses to be with me. W while waiting for Beavis, I planned out what we're going to do tomorrow. As he got back from the outhouse, ooh, I couldn't contain my excitement and told him right away. Uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm all better now. Maybe it's time for me to go home. Huh? Why so sudden? I'm sorry, but I really can't take this anymore. No, how could my first love end this fast? It hasn't even started. Brenna, it's so tough for me to live here. I don't want to boil ice every time I need a cup of water or go to the toilet out in the freezing cold. And how tiring that we can only go around on sleds. But even if we had a car, there's literally nowhere to go in this gloomy place. But still, I've endured it all this whole time because I can't leave you. I think I'm in love with you. Beavis, I... How about you going to the city with me so that we could stay together? Oh my, it turned out that we both have feelings for each other, but because of that, he had to suffer in silence. Such a sweet guy. And it's true, he wasn't built for this harsh climate. He didn't belong here. The next morning, I told Elden and Era that I wanted to hang out in Miami for some days. Rana, I don't think it's a good idea. That pansy boy must have coaxed you to do this. Don't buy those sweet words. I tried my best to explain how nice and polite Beavis was, but they wouldn't listen. Girl, he got you all blinded. You've only known him for a few days, not enough to tell what kind of person he is. Can't believe you're just one of those shallow girls. Who are you calling shallow? Yeah, right. I was blinded. Blinded by his kindness. Then I stormed off, leaving Elden and Ira behind. I just worry about you. Yeah, right. Worry? Or are you just jealous of me? I came home to a shivering Beavis. He couldn't stand this freezing weather anymore, and I couldn't bear seeing him like this either. So I told Beavis that I would go with him. Look how happy Beavis was, and I too was excited to visit his hometown. It's gonna be fun! It took only less than two days for us to arrange things out, buy the tickets, ask Ira to look after Bam and Holly, and we're good to go. After a long flight, we're finally here. It looks like a completely different world in front of my eyes. Crowds of people are rushing left and right. Suddenly, I spotted something. Oh, that looks just like my Holly. What a spoiled husky. At that age, my two buddies were already the best sled dogs in the area. Oopsie. City folks don't seem too friendly, do they? Huh? What else? Why is it moving so fast and nonstop? While I hesitated to take a step, Beavis suddenly carried me up in the air. Don't worry, I got you. Oh boy, he's so sweet. Beavis then got me transformed into a city girl. He took me shopping, then got my hair dyed. I really like my silky black hair, but Beavis said this looked better on me. This too, baby girl. This is a tattoo parlor, isn't it? Seeing my confusion, Beavis explained that couples here usually get tattooed on important occasions, and today marks the first day that you walk into my world, so I want it imprinted in my heart. So Beavis and I got matching tattoos that he chose, a weird looking red shape behind the ears. It might not look pretty, but was definitely unique enough to be special for just us two. Once we were done shopping, we went to a luxurious villa. Oh my, is he taking me to his parents? I'm so nervous, not sure how I should behave when Beavis comforted me. They were nice, don't worry, just do as they tell you to. Just then, the main door opened. Everyone turned to look at us full of excitement. This must be the first time Beavis took his girlfriend home then. Uh, hello, hello everyone. I... Suddenly a man walked straight over and lifted my chin. Very similar, but... But this, but that. Just look at her birthmark. It's Demi. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. Our, Our beloved, beloved daughter, daughter has returned. returned.
I was still processing everything when everyone rushed to hug me and bombarded me with questions. I turned to Beavis for help, but where is he? What's going on? I tried to explain that I was Brenna, born in the snowy Arctic. Both my parents had passed away and this was my first time leaving my hometown, but to no avail. My precious daughter, Beavis told us everything. You fell in the woods and had a concussion, so you're having a temporary memory loss. Just get rested for now, okay? Oh, where is Beavis then? I gotta ask him something. Don't worry, your savior will be well rewarded. You'll see him tomorrow. <sighs> everything happens so fast, I'm totally lost. But the most I could do now is to wait until tomorrow. I'm sure Beavis will clear things up. Upon catching sight of Beavis, I immediately unloaded it all onto him. Shush, just listen to me first. Turned out, Beavis worked here for the Atchley's family. He escorted their daughter, Demi, on a trip to the mountains, but she ran away. Mrs. Atchley was utterly furious about this and used his ill mother to blackmail him into finding Demi. That's why he risked going out into the snowstorm where we met. But why me? I have nothing to do with Demi. You and Demi look just like twins. <gasps> when I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes either. I did what I did because I was worried for my mom. I hope you can forgive me and help us, please. I'll soon find Demi. So, you were only using me? No, I'm truly in love with you, Brenna. I didn't want to be away from you, and you deserve a much better life here, with me. But... Just wait until I find Demi, then we will run away and live happily together. Poor Beavis. He seriously had the worst luck. If I were him, I guess I would do the same. So I reluctantly lived as Demi. Luckily, her parents thought I lost my memory, which made it not too hard to be her. One day, I received a text from Eldon. I suddenly remembered that I'd been away from home for almost a month. I wonder if Bam and Holly miss me. To say I was not one bit homesick would be a lie. But there's no way I'd speak to Eldon. So I called Ira to catch up on things and asked for her help in the search for Demi. It had been a few days already, but neither Ira nor Beavis had heard anything about Demi. Feeling too restless, I went for a walk in the garden. Wait, what's that noise? Elden? See what you got yourself into, idiot. Told ya, I saw right through him. Why are you here? And what are you talking about? Ira already told me. Beavis obviously only sees you as someone else's replacement. He doesn't love you. Let's go home. No, let me go. Stop bothering my girl. Leave me alone, please. You're only making things worse. This place has everything and is much better than a hellhole in the middle of nowhere. Live there all you want. Don't drag me down with you. Eldon immediately let my hand go. He didn't say another word, but gave me a disappointed look. Was that too much? Well, he's the one who kept sticking his nose in others' business. Who is he to control me? After that day, I still saw him lurking around the mansion sometimes. So annoying. Who in their right mind would be out in this scorching heat? Today, Mom, I mean Mrs. Ashley, suddenly took me shopping. I guess having a family like this isn't too bad, huh? She said tonight I was attending an important dinner party, so I had to put on this tight dress along with a pair of killer heels. They looked pretty good, but I really couldn't breathe. Jeez, how can anyone do this? It's literally harder than walking on thin ice. Ah! Phew, that was close. Thank you, sir. I- Careful, I can't be around to protect you all the time. Alden, why is he still so kind to me? I wanted to say something to him, but Mom already signaled for me to hurry up from afar. I rushed to the car, leaving him there. Thanks to Mom's preparation, the guys there were staring at me without blinking, especially the special guest. Mom told me that I was supposed to be smiley and friendly to Otis, but how was I supposed to do that when he kept rambling all these boring stories? My eyes wandered around, searching for Beavis and an excuse to leave. What are you looking for, sweetie? The most important person is already right in front of you. Ugh! I pushed him away, then ran off. Ah, there Beavis is! We should get out of this boring place! Oh, Mrs. Ashley's here too? What? That's it? I risked being in danger just to find her and bring her back to you. Don't take me for a fool. I'm only her stepmother, but I can tell that girl isn't Demi. I just let you off since she resembled her quite a bit. You're in no position to demand. But didn't you get Otis all smitten also? Isn't that all you care about anyway? So give me my money. I had to rack my brain to sweet talk that girl into coming here. That means your sickly mother doesn't exist either, does she? Oh, sweetie, you've heard it all. So what if that's true? You won't get a dime. I'll expose your scheme. Where are you going, sweetheart? It's bedtime. So my phone was confiscated and I'd been locked in this room for three days straight. They wanted me to give in and date Otis, but no way. I tried every possible way to escape, but always ended up getting caught. One morning, I was woken up by dogs barking. Annoyed, I went to the balcony to check and saw Eldon and Bam. 
Eldon signaled for me to stay calm and flew a paper plane to me, then swiftly left. Let's see. <gasps> Fine then, if that's what he wants. Let's end things here once and for all. I agreed to date Otis like the Ashleys demanded. I even enthusiastically chose my own outfit, did my makeup with a cute hairstyle. Mr. and Mrs. Ashley were very pleased with that. They couldn't hide their excitement and even stood at the gate to welcome Otis when he came to pick me up. As his supercar arrived, Otis, the preppy guy, had just stepped out when Eldon signaled Bam to charge at him and scared him away. Meanwhile, the Ashleys were screaming for security. I was gonna leave in the midst of the chaos, but... Don't you dare run away! Ugh! Holly jumped out of nowhere and made Beavis fall to his knees. Holly then bit on his pants and dragged him around. Good job, baby! Right then, a car stopped in front of us and a girl stepped out who looked just like me. <gasps> this must be Demi! Who are you? Why do you look exactly like my daughter? What kind of father are you to not recognize your own child? This is precisely why I ran away from home. After that, Demi exposed her stepmother and Beavis's evil plan in my stead. Demi's dad frantically apologized to his daughter and admitted that he'd always been so caught up with work that he overlooked family and his wife's scheme. Get out of my sight at once and don't even think about bringing a dime with you. Then Eldon dragged me into the car and in the driver's seat was... Era! Thank you, Era. Just me? Eldon did most of it. I shyly looked over at Eldon. Thank you, and I'm sorry. It's okay, we're friends after all. I'll take care of you at all costs. Um, uh, anyway, just hope that you've learned your lesson now, Brunna. Not all that glitters is gold. Eldon's right. This beautiful city is glamorous, but I don't belong here. I belong to the wind and snow, to the winterland I call home. Time to go back. The trip to the city was like a fever dream, but let's leave it all behind, cause I'm busy racing with Eldon. As expected, he's always as slow as a turtle. Hi, this is for you. For me? What's the occasion? The day we stop being friends. Brenna, what do you say if we become more than friends? I stood in front of this shabby cottage. <sighs> trying to calm myself and went inside. One step in, and the door snapped shut. I freaked out and banged on the door. Let me out! Let me out! But only ghastly laughter resounded. Just then, I could feel someone coming close to me. I turned around and was terrified by what I saw. Hey, Clover here, the one that just got scared witless. I know, so embarrassing. Let me tell you how I got myself into that situation in the first place. But before I do, please like and subscribe. I used to have everything. I come from a family of esteemed cardiologists who's made numerous contributions to the medical field. And as the next generation of Howards, I took immense pride in continuing their legacy, which was getting a Harvard medical degree and becoming a doctor. That's why I always made sure my academic record was top notch. I went to this elite private school, aced every subject and became the class president. Finally, winter dance prepping's finished so I could sit back and watch this magical night come to life. Suddenly, my phone got a notice. It's an article about my parents and how they were involved in an operation that cost a patient's life. No way was this real. But when I looked up, everyone was giving me bombastic side eyes. Jeez, I should go to my parents now. I had to ask as soon as I found them. Mom, Dad, what the press is saying isn't true, right? Honey, listen. When the patient was brought in, there wasn't much we could do for her. It was too late. Turns out, she's from the Albert family, a very powerful family in the country. They didn't take it too well, especially her son. He blamed my parents for his mom's passing, meaning this media crisis was his doing. My parents explained to him many times, but to no avail. Now he even took legal actions against them. They had no choice but to show up in court. The incident quickly became the talk of the town. Everyone was throwing jibes at us. Gosh, all these turmoils were driving me insane. Clover, can you solve this equation? Clover? Clover! Stop! The whole room turned silent for a second and stared at me like I was some freak. I picked up my books and stormed right out of class, but still, whispers followed me everywhere I went. There was no other place for me to be, so I just ran home and wept tears of frustration. My parents came in all worried for me. They thought maybe it's best if I stayed at my aunt's place. But mom, dad, I can't just leave you here. You're not leaving us. It's just that things are messy right now, and we don't want you to be affected. Besides, it's just temporary. Once the lawsuit's over, we'll reunite. Promise? Promise. When I arrived at my aunt's house, she seemed annoyed. Your room's in the attic. 
You're just here temporarily, so do not make any fuss. It's bad enough your parents got slapped with a lawsuit. Just then, I got a text. Mom's checking in on me. I shouldn't worry her, right? But honestly, I'm not sure how I'd survive this place. First day of school, I had to ride this pile of junk here. Cycling alone made me sweat like a dog. Just then, a boy passed by and yelled at me. Hey, you got a fat side! Excuse me? I said, you got a flat tire! Oh, that explains a lot. He helped me fix it. A few minutes later, the bike was good to go. The guy's Percy. He went to the same school as me, and today was also his first day. So, we arrived at school together. As soon as we entered the hallway, everyone stared at us. Suddenly, two girls came dragging me aside. Who are you? Why are you with Percy? You're not his girlfriend, right? Jeez, I met him ten minutes ago. I don't even know who he is. OMG, you live under a rock or something? He's Percy Albert, the sole heir of the powerful Albert family. That name, could it be a coincidence? The son that insisted on suing my parents went to the same school as me? Hold on, Clover. This could be your chance to manipulate him into withdrawing the lawsuit. And boom, things could go back the way they were. Hmm, let's see. I could make him fall for me. People would do anything for love, right? Lucky me, Percy and I were in the same biology class where we worked in pairs. The two girls from before, Holly and Jody, started fighting to be his lab partner. Meanwhile, he straight up asked me. Well, well, not a finger lifted and the prey was already in my trap. That night, I went on his social media account and found out he often golfed at Rolling Greens. I could be a caddy, just had to apply for the position. I got accepted in no time and quickly got used to the job. Oh, and I just happened to go through Percy's golfing schedule and totally did not plan this chance encounter. I parked the golf cart ready to seduce my Ken doll, but somehow standing in front of me was Holly and Jody. What took you so long? Do you know how hot it gets? At least I still got a chance with him on the field. But as soon as these blondies caught sight of Percy, they flew towards him like moths to a flame. So I was left to carry these human-sized bags. Ew, she's stinking with sweat. Social distance, please. Stop, you're being mean. Clover, let me help you with that. Thanks, you came to my rescue again. No worries. Say, I didn't know you worked here. Yeah, I'm pretty good at golf. By the way, for your 50-yard shot, you might want to use this club. Center yourself and give it a good backswing. Percy took my advice and caught a strike. Already? Hey, how would you like to be my personal caddy? Hmm, I don't know. Come on, help a guy out. Okay, on one condition. When the time's right, I'll use this card. When exactly? I'm so intrigued right now. <laughs> you just wait. From then on, we always stick together golfing and hiding from Holly and Jody. Hey, are you free this Saturday? Since you helped me out and everything, I, um, want to repay you. Yes, my plan worked. I was so happy I could jump up and scream. But that only happened inside my head. I still gotta play it cool. Only if it's a date. Saturday came and we took a trolley downtown to watch the streets in the fall. Look at how pretty the golden leaves are. We then stopped at this carnival. And I gotta admit, Percy seemed genuinely sweet. He protected me from the rushing crowd, held my hand when I was petrified on the Ferris wheel. His caring gestures had my heart racing a bit, and also wondered, how could this guy resent my parents that much? As the last ray of sunlight disappeared, the carnival lit up, and Percy's eyes suddenly looked so dreamy. Snap out of it, Clover! You're supposed to make him fall for you, not the other way around! The ride ended and I immediately went to get some refreshments to calm myself down. But holy cow, I couldn't find my wallet anywhere. What do I do? Excuse me, I'll pay for her. How much is it? Thank you so much. I owe you big time. No worries. Please, at least give me your contact. I'll pay you back. Is that your way of asking me out? No, I... Well, if your boyfriend doesn't mind, give me your hand. Meet me at Caribou's Coffee Shop, 8 a.m. Sunday. Here, treat. After the date, I was sure Percy had feelings for me. I just needed to make him say it. Then I spotted Dumb and Dumber sneaking around my locker. They're trying to fake a note from Percy to me. Tell her to meet Percy at the haunted house in the woods. Then we'll trap her inside. Hmm, lame pranks. But I suppose I can go along with them and get Percy all worked up. Nice. And of course, gotta let Percy know where I was heading. I know this was a stupid prank, but the eerie vibe still gave me the creep. I stood in front of this shabby cottage, <sighs> trying to calm myself and went inside. One step in and the door snapped shut. 
I freaked out, banged on the door. Let me out! Let me out! But no use. Only the sound of ghastly laughter resounded. Just then, I could sense someone coming closer to me. I turned around, so terrified, blood drained from my face. Oh my ghost! Stop shrieking, stupid child. I'm not a ghost yet. He, he's a real person? Clover, don't worry. It's just my grandpa. Grandpa? What's your grandpa doing here? Um, this is my house. So, this used to be his granddad's house when he was young. Since Percy's mom passed away, grandpa's health deteriorated. No one in the family cared about him except Percy, as they were all deep in sorrow and hatred. Percy mourned for his mom too, but had to stay strong for his grandpa. So, he brought him back to this peaceful house, hoping grandpa would feel better. At that moment, I felt bad for what happened to Percy and his family. Losing their loved one must have been so painful. I suddenly understood his motive now, and he badly needed this hug. Clover, I think I'm in love with you. I gushed over his words. Looking in his eyes, I knew it was real, and what I felt for him was also genuine. We could work this out, right? I'd tell him the truth and my side of the story. He'd understand. Percy, I love- But one phone call from mom changed everything. Honey- we lost the case. Their son has taken everything away from us. Our property, our legacy. Your dad was so distressed, he almost had a heart attack. Hearing mom's words, tears started streaming down my cheeks. What was I thinking? How could we possibly be together? After that, I avoided Percy completely. I also decided to move out of my aunt's and find a new place. And guess who hooked me up? It's Hunter, the guy I met at the carnival. We did end up going on a coffee date. He seemed cool and knew his way around town. So I asked if he knew a place that me and my parents could stay, as they'd move here soon. Look at this. Pretty cozy, huh? Hunter was nice enough to help me move. Just then, there's a knock on the door. I opened it to see Percy. He got so worried and went looking for me. But once he saw Hunter, he was dumbstruck. Didn't expect you'd find this place so fast, brother. Wait, you two are brothers? Sadly, yes. And we're supposed to mourn for our late mother. Yet here he is playing lovebirds with you. If losing mom isn't that big of a deal for him, let's see how he'd like losing you. Don't you dare touch her. Or what? You'll punch me? You Alberts are the worst. Was ruining my family not enough? What are you talking about? I'm Clover Howard. My parents were the doctors who tried to save your mom, but got punished for that. I was so stupid to think I could convince you to drop the lawsuit. My family's in shambles now. Happy? I, I didn't know. Get out. Never come near me again. Percy had to haul off with a regretful look. A few days later, my parents arrived. I told them everything that had happened, but they said the son who pressed charges was actually Hunter, not Percy. Turns out, their family situation was complicated. Hunter went missing when he was seven, and not until recently did he return. But then his mom unexpectedly passed away. He must have been so miserable that he had to take it out on us. Percy, on the other hand, was really thoughtful and understanding. He did all he could to stop his brother, and I just put it all on him. I had to go fix this. When I got to the cottage, Percy was trying to stop Hunter from messing with my family again. You don't get a say in this. You grew up with mom's love while I got nothing, and you couldn't even pay her proper respect. We can mourn her in different ways. Mom wouldn't want us to dive deep in hatred. <laughs> mom wouldn't want us to befriend people who couldn't save her. And you fell in love with their daughter? Traitor! Hunter was about to punch Percy. I had to stop him. Quick! Clover? You should leave now. No, I came here to apologize to you. We gotta work things out. Then let's have a little chit-chat, shall we? I was so close to having a taste of Hunter's fist when Percy came between us and took the full blow. We both ended up on the floor. And when we looked up, their grandpa was already there and witnessed everything. Percy, Hunter, stop fighting! His breath suddenly fell short. His knees were trembling. I immediately called my parents for help, but Hunter snatched my wrist. What are you doing? Call your parents here to mock us? No, I'm just trying to help. He then was on the phone with their family doctor, but she couldn't come because there was a storm blocking all roads. Please, can't you see Grandpa's in pain? You shut it. I'd never get help from those lousy doctors again. Hunter, I'm sorry for what happened. I really am. But don't let your hatred endanger your granddad. I could see Hunter's conflict, but with every second passed, their grandpa became pale. His breath got weaker. He needed to decide now. P please save him. 
I immediately called my parents. Minutes later, they arrived and gave him first aid right away. Luckily, Grandpa reacted positively to the medication and gradually recovered. Hunter then broke down in tears. I can't believe I almost put Grandpa in danger just because of my blind hatred. And you didn't think twice about helping. I, I'm so, so sorry, everyone. Clover, Mr. and Mrs. Howard, I promise I'll make this right. The following day, Hunter arranged a press conference admitting he was wrong to bring my parents to court. Thus, he'd take full responsibility in fixing his mistakes, including clearing our reputation and compensating us financially. When it's settled, we started a new life here. My parents bought a house, founded this hospital to help people, while I got to continue my dream of becoming a doctor. Harvard meds, here I come! Oops, almost forgot. Of course, Percy and I got together. You didn't think we went through all that, and I never admitted my feelings, did you? I'd been holding it back for what felt like forever. Now, I get to have my happy ending. Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six. But I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting, ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent, and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary. Diane's parents were researchers away in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry, or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect! First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then, a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This tenth contract would be my final case— then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. 
Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me? I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl. He's just so strict about things like this. You're right. Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't-be-wife-two-people-at-the-same-time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S celine he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the U.S. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm going to do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matin, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye Harper and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matten listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun. His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet. 
After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse. A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine. You've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl. This means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot, and there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together. And I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. I was walking down the hallway to see the infamous dude standing there, doing his old trick to pick on some shy student. Get that filthy hand off him now! Then I grabbed him and threw him away like a piece of paper. Ah, that's better. Konnichiwa, I'm Yukiko from Japan, the daughter of Fuji, a famous martial art master and the principal of a karate school. As his only child, it's up to me to evolve my warrior spirit and protect the weak from any baka. And this shy girl is Chiharu, the one I saved from a fight with the rival school gang. 
And ever since then, we became besties. Well, that's also how I earned the nickname Big Boss. I don't really care about it, but it does have some perks. I always had the best reserved seat next to the window, a desk drawer full of snacks, and on top of that, the kid was competing every day to do my homework. However, it also caused me some complications. I seem to have caught the eye of Jun, that rival school's gang leader. He bought me flowers and sent me these cheesy cupcakes every day, but I only gave him a no. Hey, he comes again. If I was your boyfriend, never let you go. Keep you on my arm, girl. You keep go, never be alone. Tomato, tomato, throwing tomatoes. Even when the guard came carrying him away, he was still shouting. You Kiko died, Scooter! Gosh, he's such a bug. Later, I came into the classroom and found everyone was going cuckoo over something. How noisy. That's the new student. He's just so handsome. As if you could tell someone's handsome from the back. But when he turned around, my eyes almost bulged from their sockets. It's Akira. Back when we were little, I adored Akira from the moment I first saw him. To me, he was even cuter than my favorite Mochi Shiba plushie. So I followed him everywhere and gave him all the candies I had. But he didn't like it that much. Why did you give her my candies? I like Akira. If you take him from me, I'll punch you. Hey, martial arts is not about fighting nonsense. You fierce kid, I hate you. After a while, Akira's family moved away and I'd completely lost contact with him. And now he's back. Our eyes met, but he looked so cold and turned away. He didn't recognize me? Fine. It was so embarrassing facing him again anyway, so I decided to avoid him like the plague since then. And just like that, with his excellent academic ability, Akira soon fell into place as the top student, while I'm a bit different. I may have been a black belt in the karate, but exams were definitely not my thing. Congratulations, you've excelled at coming last again. So, Yukiko, I've appointed another student to tutor you. Please don't say his name, please don't say his name, please, please, please. Akira, I nearly died on the spot. Can anybody throw me to Mars, please? Man, it's super awkward. I kept looking at the ground when he blurted out, Hi, Yukiko. Long time no see. So, he does remember me? During the lesson, I couldn't focus, and my body was heating up. I kept my mouth shut while he was immersed in his lecture. If there's anything you don't understand, feel free to ask. I plucked up my courage and said, Why didn't you like me when we were kids? You're still acting like before. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you, but your head's stuck in the clouds. Focus. He didn't say he hated me, did he? My heart fluttered again. Guess I'd have to try harder to get his attention then. But things didn't exactly go as planned. During the lessons with Akira, my phone rang constantly with calls and messages. Seemed like my goons were in trouble and they needed my help. I tried my best to ignore it, but finally gave in. I've got something to do. I'll be right back. Hey, those morons. They're always messing around, then leave it to me. Problem solved. Only that, lucky for you, I got there in time. In time to cause more trouble, I'd have eaten them for breakfast without you. Back at school, I saw Akira standing at the gate with a clearly not happy face. Akira, it's not like what you think. I- You find it hard to study, but fighting seems to come naturally to you, huh? Who the freak are you? How dare you talk to my girl like that? Akira, I fight to help people. It's not nonsense. Help? I suppose brainless people only know how to talk with their fists. June immediately lunged at Akira, raising his fists at him. I had to hold him back right away and told him to go. The silence went on for some minutes, but when he was about to leave, I couldn't stand it anymore. Just because I liked you then, you think you have the right to look down on me? What? Hear this. I do like you, but it doesn't mean I will like you forever. I don't care, but I'm sorry if the truth I spoke made you feel that I looked down on you. And you know what? If you can't take my tutoring seriously, then we're done. Fine, go! See if I care. I, the big boss myself, have my own limits and cannot be chasing him all the time. But I couldn't deny that a pit was dropping to the bottom of my stomach. I just want to go home and curl up under cover. Then I arrived at my family's karate academy to see it was all sealed off. And my dad was sitting on the doorstep holding a letter. Dad? What happened? Yukiko, I'm bankrupt. I had no choice but to sell the academy to moneylenders. I've lost everything. No! This academy is our family legacy. My dad's life's work. We couldn't lose it. 
So I followed the address on the letter, but there I met an unexpected person. June! Turns out, his dad is my dad's creditor. All or nothing, I decided to get straight to the point to him. What do my family have to do to get our martial arts school back? June came over and whispered something in his ear. Then he pondered a while and said, My son kept goofing around. Change him and the martial arts school is back to yours. But how? I want you to get engaged to my son. Are you serious? You think I'm a joke? Then I immediately stood up and left. That was insane. Hey, why are you behaving like that? You're still asking why? It's down to that dude, isn't it? He's just some preppy know-it-all who doesn't even like you. You, you know nothing. He also likes me, I think. Is that so? Then prove it. Make Akira fall in love with you within two weeks, and I'll convince my father to extend the deadline by three months. Fail, and we get engaged. I'm the one who is always by your side. No way I agree with your stupid deal. Go ahead, refuse. The martial arts school will be permanently closed tomorrow. Wait, I, I, okay, I'm in. Lucky enough, I had Chiharu, the love guru, to help me cook up the perfect Get Akira scheme. Though she'd been single, like, forever. <laughs> Firstly, I told my gang that Akira'd soon to be my BF, and also their boss, so he deserved a special treat. Wherever he went, other students bowed 90 degrees to greet him. They tended to his every need, carried his bag, and were always at his service. But he seemed not so comfortable about this. Ask your goons to stop their nonsense. Okay, as long as you agree to my conditions. What? Tutor me again. Oh, and have lunch together. And walk to and from school? I... I can't. Okay then. Guys? Fine. Secondly, you needed to find out what Akira like, but he'll refuse to answer my questions for sure. My fake council survey will answer that. Then she handed out the paper to the whole class. My goofy Chiharu did get it done this time. Okay, according to a philosopher, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Akira's most favorite food is beef, so I rummaged through all the local supermarkets to find A5 Wagyu beef and prepared this perfect meal for him. Akira, eat this. Oh, thank you, Cream Puff. How come you know I like beef? How did you get in here? I know you miss me, so I come to visit. Before I could say anything, Akira shook his head and walked off. Okay, the first step is always the hardest. Next, seeing that Akira liked horror movies, I lied to him that Chiharu stood me up, so I had an extra ticket. It's insidious. How could he refuse? But as soon as we sat down, a familiar face caught my attention. June? Stop messing with me, you child! Eh? I'm a horror fan, just like you. We're sure a match made in heaven. I tried to ignore him and focus on my plan. This was the third time I watched this, so I knew exactly when there'd be a jump scare. It's time. I pasted a whining look on my face and was about to lean on Akira when June suddenly screamed his lungs out and jumped at me. It was not until he fell asleep that we had a bit of privacy, but from then till we left, Akira didn't speak a word and even asked to leave early. That's not okay. If things kept going this way, the whole plan would definitely fail, and it means I'd have to get engaged to June. No! The next day, I wasn't in the mood for dealing with my friends, so I lingered back in the classroom and read through Akira's notes. Oh, what's this? So, he does care about me. I can see one ray of hope. Akira, I want to improve my studies. Help me? Oh, okay. I was waiting outside for Akira to get us some bubble teas before we started when suddenly this thief darted out and snatched this old lady's bag. I dove in there to help, but he knocked me to the ground and ran away. Here you go. You're already fighting again? Don't you have anything better to do? I'm not fi- Forget it anyway. This brave young lady helped me. W what? Say no more. I'm a bad person no matter what. Then I stormed off without looking back. I was so stupid to catch feels with that insensitive one. Then my knee suddenly collapsed. Right then, a hand reached out and gently wrapped a bandage around my knee. Leave me alone. Get on my back. Shut up. Come on. I couldn't help but smile through my frown, and my heart did a cartwheel. I clambered onto his back and looped my arms around his neck. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you- It's okay. Are you dumb? An injured leg is not enough? It's nothing. And- you don't have to carry me like this. Am I heavy? What? <laughs> if I say yes, will you jump off? No way.
After that day, Akira changed towards me. He joined me for lunch and even gave me a cute cupcake and agreed to go to Cat Cafe with me, even though he's allergic. And the classes went so smoothly. He was sweet like a lollipop and answered to all my silly questions. One time, I even accidentally saw him putting a lot of bandages in my locker. Aww. Winning the bet didn't seem so impossible then, but suddenly a girl approached him. It was Amaya, the school's popular girl. They chewed the fat. Then she leaned closer and whispered something to him. His face suddenly turned cold. Then he walked away. I was about to go after him when my phone beeped. Can't tutor you today. I have a play audition. So, turns out Akira and Amaya were both in this play. Fine, if Akira's Romeo, then I must be Juliet. I made it to the final round with my big boss energy, which meant I got to act out a scene with Akira to see who got the female lead between me and Amaya. Oh dear, look at them, being all clingy for what? That snake was all over my poor Akira like a rash. Ugh, if Chiharu hadn't constantly held me back, I'd have jumped there and given her a piece of my mind. And now, it's time for me to shine. But why is Akira's face darkened? It's okay, maybe he's trying to be professional? My bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love... My love, as adoring as, as a puppy dog's nose. Um, yes, so I may have forgotten the words, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> he may pick me for my quick thinking, and... I choose Amaya, miss. Hey, why did you pick her? You shouldn't ask me. Ask yourself instead. Then he left with Amaya without glancing at me. But today is the end of the two-week deadline. I thought you'd have some feelings for me, too. It was pouring rain. I trudged home. All collapsed, tears and rain falling down all over my face. It was all over. The bed I play, the boy I love. I should have known better that it was me onto a loser right from the outset. Through my teary eyes, I saw June running towards me. Yukiko, what's wrong? Tell me. I, I lost. What? The bet between us. I lost it. I was wrong about everything. Who cares about the bet? You might get a cold, you know. Get inside. But why you're here? I don't care if you think it's too late. I'm telling you anyway. I know that I'm not perfect like him. I do say the wrong thing. I forget all the time, but I... I can protect and will never hurt you. So will you... marry me? My head was spinning, and in a moment of weakness, I said yes. At least I can save my dad's school and be with the right person who truly cares about me, instead of chasing some jerk who thought so low of me. I confided in Chiharu and my family about this, but kept it a secret from everyone else. <sighs> my father didn't approve it at first, but seeing my determination, he reluctantly agreed. It was our fitting day. I was with June discussing our wedding, but he seemed distracted and kept checking his phone. Then he said he had to take a call and hurried out. Sensing something was up, I followed him. Huh? Why is he talking to Amaya? You have to thank me for your new fiancé. I told Akira about your bet. Um? Excellent job, as promised. It's not about the money. It's about making Akira mine. I don't get why both you and my beautiful Yukiko like that dude so much. Anyway, Yukiko's waiting for me. Gotta go. I couldn't believe what was in front of me. What the heck are you doing here? So it's you who made up everything the whole time? No, Yukiko. Let me explain. I trusted you, Jun. But look what you've done. You know what? You win. Do your worst. I don't care anymore. Then I ran home as fast as I could. Why do boys all fool me around like that? Right when I felt more disheartened than ever... I met the one that I didn't want to see the most. What was Akira doing here? Yukiko, let's talk. We have nothing to talk about. Chiharu told me what you're doing. You can't marry June. You liked me, so you mustn't fall for another one that easily. What? So you're the commander of my feelings now? Aren't you with Amaya? I'm not, and I never did. Listen, I was so angry to find out I was just part of your bet with June, so I ignored you. But then Chiharu told me why you did it and made me understand. So what? Anyway, you never liked me. I'm not gentle and too fierce, as you said before. Don't try to pity me. I don't. It's that I do like you. At first, I thought you were the type of person who'd use violence to solve any problem. But the more I got to know you, the more I learned about your pure heart. I shouldn't have judged you so quickly. I'm sorry. What just happened? I might be dreaming? But no, Akira, my seven-year crush, just confessed his love with me. So, Akira and I got together. June was furious about it, but he kept his word, and now my dad has three months to pay off his debt. I'm helping him out by teaching karate classes to earn money, something I really enjoy. Everything was great, too great, until... Yukiko, I gotta tell you something. I... I have to go abroad to study. I'll leave. Tomorrow. What? I don't understand. Why so sudden? I prepared for it months ago, but I couldn't tell you. 
I didn't want to make you sad. Will you wait for me? Of course not. I may get bored and start liking another by that time. It's time. I stood still watching the train pass by until I noticed Akira's melancholy smile. I liked you seven years ago, and now I still do. So of course I can wait for you. Come back soon, Akira.